yeah, go on now, get out, go on now, get out. Have Phil McCoy feud, yep, yep, yeah. Murder, more murder, vigilante justice, more murder, revenge killings, posses being formed, a father losing five of his children's lives to another family's violence, a stolen hog, a family home burned to the ground by an angry mob, government corruption, forbidden love affairs, a lot of drama in today's tale. The Hatfields and the McCoys repeatedly attacked one another in the rural Tug River Valley, separating West Virginia and Kentucky for over a decade in the late 19th century. Two patriarchs, Devil Ann's Hatfield and old Randall McCoy, let their hatred of one another infect first their entire families and then an entire region of the country. Governor pitted against Governor West Virginia versus Kentucky. The Supreme Court of the United States would end up getting involved. Uh, the feud in general would last for many decades. So how did it all start? How did it finally end? And how much blood was shed in between the origins and the dirty deeds of America's most famous feud revealed today on Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Time Suckers. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, praise Bojangles, hail Triple M. I'm Dan Cummins, the Master Sucker, and you are listening to Time Suck, recorded in the Suck Dungeon today in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Reverend Dr. Joe motherfucking Paisley. Hope you loved him on last week's uh, special guest edition of Idiots of the Internet. He uh, did, some, did some magic today, too. We had some tech problems recording this episode the day before Thanksgiving. It was looking rough, but Joe, he, he figured out some wizard trick from some wizard forum, and he got us going. I uh, hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, I know I did. Recording this, uh, again, beforehand. Uh, or I, I'm sorry, I hope I did. How would I know I did? I haven't had it yet. What am I talking about? It's time! It gets confusing here sometimes, recording episodes in advance. Uh, just going to be Lindsay and I and Penny and Ginger, uh, you know, this, uh, this past Thanksgiving. And uh, I'm guessing we were able to relax a lot. I know in this moment that I record this, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. Just uh, chilling out. For a couple days, and just for being thankful, man, super thankful for uh, this little world and and how far it's come since we started, and all of your guys' support, like very, very thankful. Uh, just so many little cool things. Uh, I was coming back from Grand Rapids this uh, this past week, and just walking to the Spokane Airport, and a uh, space lizard. Don't know his name because he was on the other side of security glass. He was coming into the airport. I'm leaving. He's in the little TSA area. And, uh, and he just mouths the words, uh, you know, well, actually, I can't say because it's for space lizards only. He, he mouthed a secret space lizard code. I, I knew what he said. I gave him a secret space lizard hand sign. He gave it back to me. And it was, uh, it was a very cool moment. And I'm super thankful to have life experiences like that. Um, yeah, just thankful for, man, this, uh, you guys sharing this uh, podcast with your friends and families and just seeing it grow. And, uh, you know, st sending in stories of reconnecting with family members, having something new to talk about every week, reconnecting with old friends, making new friends, having fun with your, with your lovers and your, and your spouses, and uh, just enjoying this silly little world that, uh, that we've created. Where I just basically just try to be honest, try to make it fun, try not to shove either a conservative or, or liberal agenda down your throat, and just try to instill or reinstill a, a childlike sense of wonder about the world. Because it's so important, man. And it's so fun just to be like a kid that way and just be curious and excited about stuff. Uh, and just and just have a reverent fun with stuff. You know, I've said it before, but it's like my uh, grandma Betty always said, you can, you can laugh or you can cry. And I love that our community can just laugh about almost fucking anything. It's, it's I, th I think, super healthy and super fun. I uh, love you, Meat Sacks. So, so thank you for giving me uh, uh, the most meaning, uh, work-wise, for sure, that my life has ever had. Uh, and now... Let me awkwardly transition from heartwarming thanks to a blatant sales pitch. Uh, speak, speaking of meaning, there's no, I, there's no segue. Uh, but I want to say the Cyber Monday sale happening now in the Time Suck store. Uh, everything in the Suck shop is 25% off uh, using the discount code CYBERMONDAY18. So Cyber Monday and then the number 18 during checkout. And it, it'll be a banner that says that on our store. So make it real easy. Just, uh, uh, you know. It cannot to be combined with the spaces or 20% discount, but uh, yeah, 25% off of everything. And uh, the offer is good through this next Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Uh, coffee tumblers, challenge coins, hoodies, beanies, Lucifina sleepwear sets, so many sweet teas, vinyl decals, all kinds of exotic animal skins and furs and body parts. 25% uh, at all. 25% off it all. Ends at midnight Pacific time, Sunday, November 2nd. Uh, we were going to start it this past Friday. Uh, Black Friday, 
Um, but I, I messed up. I fucked up. I forgot based on the recording schedules when the episodes were coming out based uh, compared to when I was recording them and didn't realize last week when I recorded that I was recording the Thanksgiving New World Order episode when I should have mentioned it there. But we're still doing the sale for a full week. It all ends up the same. All comes out in the wash. Uh, so thanks again uh, for spreading the suck by passing around new preview videos for episodes we put on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Time Suck Podcast. Sharing those clips, tagging friends, retweeting. Uh, it all spreads the suck. And now thank you uh, to the Street Suck, or this Time Suck Street Team. Street Suck. Street Suck sounds different. Uh, Time Suck Street Team that was announced in the private Facebook group a while back. Uh, some of you lovely Time Suckers are now spreading the suck by blanketing various sections of the world with Lucifina's face, my face, other Time Suck artwork. Yeah, I had so much response to that. And I know I, I never mentioned that on the, uh, the podcast before, but that was intentional. We wanted just to mention it in the uh, private Facebook group first, see how many people responded, and we had way more interest than we had stickers, which, again, another thing to be thankful for. So uh, hopefully the street team thing goes well. People actually put the stickers that they've got uh, around around their towns and communities, and then we'll, we'll buy a whole bunch more stickers. And uh, they're really cool. Danger Brain did a good job on those, as they do on everything. And then we'll, we'll get a bunch more people involved. And I just love that people were excited to be involved. Uh, yeah. Uh, turns out I did have a great time in Grand Rapids, Michigan last weekend. Holy shit. Uh, every show outside of Thursday was sold out uh, most in advance. This is, this is new territory for me. Uh, thanks to all of you who made long drives for those shows. Thanks to Jeff and Catalin for showing up uh, so many years in a row now. Uh, and thanks to a few time suckers for, for some green medicine. Thanks to C4 in Washington for uh, handing out some delicious edible medicine when I uh, flew back into Spokane. The ride, it just keeps getting more fun. Uh, yeah, C4, I'm going to be I'm gonna be chewing up a lot of that as I just kind of relax a little bit, uh, get some rest over Thanksgiving weekend. I'll be at the Spokane Comedy Club, uh, November 29th, 30th, and December 1st. Tickets really selling fast for those shows. So, so happy. Uh, thanks to the Spokesman Review for interviewing me for those shows. Look forward to that coming out. And then I'll be in St. Louis December 6th through 9th. Wrapping up uh, the Flat Earth Tour. Those will be the last ones. Start the Happy Murder Tour next year. I'll be uh, posting dates for that soon. We've got most of next year booked. And uh, and then after that St. last St. Louis show, I'll switch gears and prep for that TED Talk. Uh, TEDx Talk in Coeur d'Alene at the Croc Center January 12th. I'll have a link for that in the episode description. Very excited to uh, think about uh, what's gone on the last few years here and, and think about how to share that in a TED Talk that hopefully will inspire other people to pursue their passions and, and make the most out of them. Now let's get to sucking. I'm very excited. I had a lot of fun researching this. Uh, a lot of fun. Uh, I'm going to suck a bunch of McCoys. I'm uh, going to suck a lot of Hatfields in today's big old meat sack showdown. All right, the time and the place of today's tale factors largely into the story, as it always seems to. A uh, few to the magnitude of the Hatfields versus the McCoys wouldn't take place in America today. Today's laws, current level of media coverage would just never allow the combination of revenge killings and vigilante justice to, to go on for as long as it did. And, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, and actually, there weren't, there weren't as many uh, places this series of events could have unfolded elsewhere in, in mid to late 19th century America either. Uh, life was just different in the Tug River Valley than it was for, for much of the nation. Dentistry was frowned upon. Uh, clothing was optional. Eyes were beady. Many folks walked on four legs instead of two. Dogs weren't just pets. They, they doubled as actual legal brides for, for many Valley residents. A, a local pastor saw what was inevitable and thought if he couldn't stop these abominable unions, uh, he, might as, he might as well make them official in the eyes of God. Uh, hogs weren't just for love and neither. Uh, many hogs actually helped provide for their human families, taking up farming, logging, uh, fur trapping uh, jobs to put food on their tables. The line between animal and man became uh, blurred, and then legend has it, uh, it actually merged. And, and new races of hog folk and dog folk were brought into the world in the Tug River Valley. And, and then those hog folk became known as the Hatfields. And those dog folk became known as the McCoys. And everybody knows the dog folk don't mix no hog folk. And that's how the few got going. Yeah, yeah, woo, yeah, yeah. Sorry, life wasn't that different in the uh, valley. And again, I wonder what the uh, people upstairs uh, think of the noises they hear from the suck dungeon. <laughs> uh, the, the valley where the famous Hatfield-McCoy feud took place was nestled into the rural mountainous region of Appalachia. Nailed it! Ah, uh, Appalachia. That's not how they say it on the pronunciation guides. But I, I learned, I learned last time we were in this region of the country that if you are from Appalachia, you don't say Appalachia. That's how, that's how you know you ain't no hog folk, you ain't no dog folk. Go on, get out of here, yeah! Uh, anyway, yes. 
It's nestled in the rural mountains of the region of Appalachia at the border of Eastern Kentucky and West Virginia. Right on the border there, we centered on the valley of the Tug Fork, the big old, big Sandy River. Uh, one of the least hospitable parts of the Appalachian Highlands here, the Tug Fork, forms both a natural and political boundary dividing the states of Kentucky and West Virginia. However, while the river did divide the two states, it didn't divide the Tug River Valley community, both the Hatfields and McCoys, they had relatives on both sides of the river. The Hatfield family had its largest uh, kind of concentration in Logan County, West Virginia, and the McCoys were most numerous in Pike County, Kentucky, uh, but the two clans did travel continuously back and forth between West Virginia and Kentucky, which just, you know, ended up adding to the feud because they were always in contact with one another. The Tug Valley was, is extremely remote, one of the largest, uh, excuse me, one of the last areas settled in both West Virginia and Eastern Kentucky. Uh, the first settlers, mostly of Scottish descent, uh, Scotch-Irish descent, arrived from southwestern Virginia around 1800. And if you'll recall from the Andrew Jackson suck, these early Scots are the origin of both the term redneck and the term hillbilly. A uh, quick recap of the origins of those two terms. Uh, the term redneck comes from 16th century Scotland when Presbyterian rebels rose up against the Church of England, signed manifestos in their own blood, hardcore, then wore red clothes around their necks to signify the rebellion during the Bishop's War of 1640 in Scotland. Uh, the term hillbilly comes from the term hill folk. Scots from the highlands of Scotland were called hill folk. And then during another war in the 1600s, the Scots who uh, supported King William of England were called Billy Boys and after, after their patron king, you know, William King Billy. Uh, hill folk who were uh, called Billy Boys were then called Hill Billy Boys, which eventually was shortened to Hill Billies. And that name followed them to colonial America. And then both the terms redneck and hillbilly became, uh, you know, uh, you know, derogatory racial slurs, essentially, synonymous with rough, rugged, ignorant rural folk, quick to fight, maybe slow to take up a reading, and a writing and arithmetic. And the Tug River Valley elements of this derogatory description actually did fit for many, and I say that as someone uh, with, a, with a Scottish last name of Cummins, and over 60% uh, British and Irish Isle ancestry. A lot of my ancestors were probably some of these rough, rugged, and uneducated people. Education, it was just hard to come by in the valley. Uh, there, were, there were a few schoolhouses uh, in the region, but kids only attended school for three months out of the year. Most dropped out entirely after only a couple years, and the majority of people in the Tug Valley were illiterate. Uh, throughout the early 19th century, this region remained extremely isolated, with frontier conditions persisting there, even as the rest of the region uh, around them progressed and developed. Uh, the area also suffered from extreme uh, income inequality. Most of the land was owned by a small percentage of the population. In some eastern Kentucky counties, up to 74% of the population was landless. Uh, a minority population of backcountry elite dominated extremely corrupt local politics. Uh, and the Hatfields and the McCoys, they belonged to this backcountry elite. The patriarchs of each family were landowners and kept a considerable number of livestock. They held similar social and economic standing. Uh, the Hatfields were better off. Uh, would actually end up becoming, you know, quite a bit better off. Uh, but during the feud, just, just you know, uh, a little clip up above the McCoys. But both, uh, you know, clans were were well off for West Virginia kind of uh, Tug River Valley standards. And they both uh, had uh, numerous family members serving in local politics and, and the judiciary system in both Kentucky and West Virginia. And again, Hatfields would have an advantage. There was seemed to be more of them. They seemed to have more prestigious positions around the community. But both of them had some pull. Uh, the Hatfields and McCoys occasionally intermarried over the years, and their intertwined social, uh, you know, familial, political relationships created a complex network of allegiances that would make the feud more complicated, add to the violence. Another important point to make before we get into the timeline of the Hatfield-McCoy feud is that feuds were not unusual in this area at this time. No less than six major feuds took place on the Kentucky side of the Tug Fork and the Sandy River in the wake uh, of the Civil War, and additional feuds also took place in nearby Perry and Roan counties. Uh, a lot of these were partly due to conflicting loyalties in the area during the Civil War. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, both West Virginia and Kentucky struggled with Union and Confederate loyalty. Uh, West Virginia was formed when a total of 50 counties chose to secede from Confederate Virginia and form a new Unionist state officially admitted to the Union in 1863. However, uh, some West Virginia residents, including the Hatfields, still had Confederate loyalty, still had Confederate sympathies, and took it as a sign of treason if one of their own supported the Union. Uh, and these feuds were also partly due to the clannish hillbillies of this area acting like clannish hillbillies. Uh, the Scotch-Irish in this area, other poor uh, rural whites were notoriously clannish. Uh, just like, uh, you know, the courts after the Civil War did not protect African Americans uh, equal to white Americans, 
They also didn't protect all white Americans equally. In, in the racial pecking order of white America at this time, you know, hillbillies were at the bottom. The Scotch-Irish were at the bottom. Many found strength in numbers. Uh, due to their rural backwoods kind of living situations, uh, the law wasn't always easy to find. Uh, you know, was often very corrupt, and they just these families would take it upon themselves to dole out and seek justice. And the combination of clans, vigilantism, that, that's a perfect, you know, kind of environment for feuds. Most of the feuds, manifestations of power struggles between, lo, you know, prominent local families like the Hatfields and McCoys, you know, product of competition for, for land, wealth, and power, just, just like countries, you know, same motivation for countries fighting one another. Uh, you know, a lot of those uh, trickle down to these uh, feuds. You know, just one family wanting, you know, more, more power, more land, more wealth, sometimes trying to take it from another family. Uh, finally, this feud took place directly on a state line. You know, the majority of the Hatfields, as we said, lived on the, on the West Virginia side of the Tug Fork, and the majority of the McCoys lived on the Kentucky side. And if you'll recall, way back, uh, from way back in the Bonnie and Clyde suck, if you were an outlaw in the early 20th century, crossing state lines often gave you the chance to escape authorities and start a new life. You felt uh, a little bolder to go break some laws in a, in a nearby state. Um, cause you could go back to, you know, you could go to a different state and get away with it. Uh, this was even more true in the late 19th century. The federal government, not as strong as it is today, especially when it came to law enforcement. And, uh, you know, one state was usually extremely reluctant to push into another state to apprehend a criminal. And if they did do that, local government in that state could and would often push back against the other state's officers, maybe not recognize them as being law officers, recognize them as trespassers. So, uh, you know, in some ways, the different states were, were almost like different countries. So now that we understand a little bit about the context, let's take some broad strokes to the two biggest players by far in today's tale, uh, the patriarchs of the Hatfield and McCoy uh, clans. Maybe the most important character in the feud is Devilands Hatfield. Half pig, half man, headed to hog folk. Everybody know hog folk don't take no guff from no dog folk. Uh, sorry. Leader, leader of the Hatfield clan, patriarch of one half of the infamous, infamous feud, uh, born William Anderson Hatfield in 1839, Devil Lands Hatfield grew up in what is now Logan County, West Virginia, born and raised in the Tug River Valley. Uh, sired in West Virginia, weaned from his mama's sweet teats right there in the valley. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Hatfields were some of the first settlers in the region, and the river served as the boundary between Kentucky and Virginia. Uh, uh, one of the 18 children born to Ephraim, and Nancy Hatfield, Devil Ann's Hatfield. And sorry if I keep repeating some of these details. There's so many characters in today's tale, I kept just having to do like mental recaps to remind myself of what in the hell is happening. It'll just become more important as the story goes on. Um, but yeah, Devil is one of 18 kids born to Ephraim, Nancy Hatfield, uh, known to be an excellent marksman and uh, horse rider. Uh, yeah, 18 kids, 18 kids. Uh, sweet Jesus, his poor, poor mother. I'm, surpri I'm surprised uh, more women didn't kill their husbands back then. You're going to hear about a lot more women having a lot more kids. Uh, yeah, just, that's just a ridiculous amount of pregnancy. I told him to not put a seed in me no more. I, I told him, I said, Robert, Bobbitt, McAllister, and Fitzgerald, you take that devil stick and you spit your baby potion on that there floor. I've been pregnant for 14 of my 27 years on this here earth. And my vagina looked look like an old witch lost a fight with a bear. And he went to Mount Manny House and that's when I shot my husband done dead. Uh, it was said that young William Hatfield was so strong and fierce that he could take on the devil himself, which is supposedly where his devil nickname may have come from. Another rumor regarding his nickname is, uh, revolves around him fighting off a mountain lion with his bare hands as a youth. Tougher than the devil. Uh, in 1861, this devil Hatfield uh, married uh, Levice Chafin, daughter of neighboring farmer. And then right after marrying her, off to Civil War he goes. Uh, fighting on the side of the Confederacy. He, he ended up uh, a local Confederacy, Confederacy supporting militia known as the Logan Wildcats with his uncle Jim Vance. Uh, Jim known locally as Crazy Jim. After the war ended, Hatfield settled down with Levice, turned to farming, cutting timber, buying real estate, uh, having bear cubs for pets, seriously, and pumping out 13 kids. Devil Ants! I, to I done told you to spill your seed outside of me. Pregnant again, you bastard. I have any more babies. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna let them fall out. Won't even have to push them. Fall out of my poor woman hole. It won't close. Baby's gonna fall out whilst I'm walking over to spit on your grave. Ambitious and aggressive. Hatfield created one of the most successful timber businesses in the area, vigorously defending it. Uh, eventually taking a man to court because he reportedly cut timber from Hatfield lands. This man was Perry Klein. He'll factor into today's tale. Hatfield won his suit against Perry Klein. Um, 
And Perry Klein would later bring national attention to the feud. Uh, Perry Klein is a uh, relative by marriage and, and friend and then attorney to the McCoys, to Randolph Randall McCoy, uh, Devilands' future nemesis. Uh, this court victory Devilands had over Perry ended up giving the devil uh, 5,000 acres of Perry's land, making him one of the biggest, if not the biggest, landowners in the valley. So that's Devilands. Powerful uh, landowner, especially uh, for this for this area. Important patriarch of the Hatfield side of the feud, and, and tough as shit. You know, maybe maybe he uh, did fight off a mountain lion when he was a kid. Maybe he didn't. But by the end of the story, it, it, he'll he'll seem like a man capable of doing that. So let's talk about his nemesis, Randall McCoy, head of the dog folk. Oh! Uh, born Randolph McCoy in 1825. And by the way, if you're getting confused, they were never referred to as dog folk and hog folk. That's my little thing. I'm going to run with it. The rest of this suck. But I don't, I don't want you to ever uh, be talking to somebody and think, yeah, yeah, there was, it was dog folk versus hog folk. Uh, born Randolph McCoy in 1825 in the Tug River Valley. Randall, later sometimes known as Old Randall, uh, born 14 years prior to Devil Ann's. He was one of 13 kids because uh, apparently back then you had to have at least 13 kids. Thank you, scientists, for birth control. Uh, thank you for vasectomies. Thank you for dismantling my balls, uh, preventing me from from placing the curse of having far too many kids upon myself. Uh, McCoy grew up in poverty. His father, Daniel, had little interest in work, so his mother, Margaret, had to struggle to care for, feed, and clothe the family. 1849, McCoy married his first cousin, Sarah Sally McCoy. Dog folk marrying dog folk. Won't, won't do no how. Having some hog folk tainting the bloodlines like mama and told daddy, grandpa, uncle. Don't poke your flesh inside no one who ain't kin. Mm, ding, 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 ding. Ding 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 ding. Uh, to be fair, as we have learned before, marrying cousins it wasn't just some uh, hillbilly thing. Uh, royals often would cousins. Even Einstein married his first. If you'll actually recall, Einstein, Elsa Einstein, Albert's his uh, Albert, I'd say his second wife, uh, was Albert's first cousin on his mother's side and second cousin on his father's side. Double cousins. Uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say is Randall McCoy was probably a genius. Sally inherited land from her father a few years after they married, lucky for Randall, and then they settled on this 300-acre spread in Pike County, Kentucky, where they had 17 kids together. 17 kids. Uh, before eventually Sally wised up and put a mouse trap inside her vagina. She was, oh, damn you scheming woman! You broke my damn pecker! You damn near snapped it in two with your mouse trap witch trickery! Uh, I'm honestly surprised that anal sex wasn't way more popular back then. Like, like maybe initially in your marriage as a, as a lady, uh, as a lady of the, of the Tug River Valley, you, you don't have any interest in anal sex. Um, but then I think like after the 12th kid, I would think you would consider it. I'm surprised some more women were just like, okay, okay, if you, if you have to keep putting that somewhere, you put it back there. You put it in my, you put it in my back door vagina. Uh, you know, but, but if nine minutes later I give birth to some butt baby demon, I will kill you, Randall McCoy. And I meant to say nine minutes. I feel like the gestation period for a demon butt baby would be shorter than for a human baby. Anyway, enough about butt babies. During the Civil War, it's never enough actually about butt babies. I could talk about butt babies all day long. During the Civil War though, McCoy served as a soldier for the Confederacy as well. Uh, he may have actually served in that same local militia as Devil Ants, his later nemesis. Uh, while most of the McCoys supported the Confederacy, Randall's brother, Aza Harmon McCoy, fought for the Union side. And this is important to note because his death would kind of be the start of the feud. It would at least, you know, uh, get brought up later uh, as far as some bad blood. Because when Aza returned home, he, he hid out in a cave for some time. He was ostracized from his community for supporting the Union. Um, but he couldn't hide, you know, for, uh, forever. In 1865, he was shot and killed by someone who objected to his Union sympathies, is what is believed. Uh, it's thought that either Devil Lance Hatfield or his fellow Confederate leader and uh, crazy-ass uncle, Crazy Jim Vance, murdered this McCoy for, for being essentially uh, a Union sympathizer. And even though, uh, you know, Aza Harmon had been ostracized from the McCoy family, you know, some historians think this killing again was the start of the bad blood because even though they're not speaking to him, he is still family. Uh, okay, so now we know a little bit about background. Rural area, backwoods justice is the norm, clans are the norm, poverty is ripe, ignorance is rampant, uh, two large families, uh, you know, they've been, they've been kicking out a shit ton of kids in the Tug River Valley for a couple generations. One on the Kentucky side of the river, one on the West Virginia side. Petty, uh, normal rivalries between the two probably have been going on for years. 
And then Devil Ants, you know, Hatfield, uh, taking a, a McCoy uh, relation to court for logging on his land, and he won. So he got some land from the McCoys in a roundabout way. Uh, then Hatfield Relations, rumored to have killed a McCoy in 1865 for being a Union sympathizer. Bad blood starting to develop. Uh, and then 13 years after the death of Aza Harmon McCoy, the feud begins in earnest with, uh, of all things, the, the theft of a hog. So let's hop into today's Time Suck timeline right after an important word from today's first sponsor. Uh, the, the, let's, let's get right into uh, Time Suck being brought to you today once again by the A-Hole Air Banjo Academy. The A-Hole Air Banjo Academy is sponsoring the first annual Tug River Valley Bluegrass Festival the entire month of August 2019. The festival will feature performances from legendary air banjo bluegrass group, the Piney Pluckers. Bing, bing, ding, ding, bing, ding, ding, bing, ding, 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 uh, the festival will also feature uh, performances from uh, uh, Nirvana Bluegrass Tribute Band, Air Nevermind. Uh, <laughs> bing, 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 of course, that's not today's sponsor. Uh, for the seven of you who haven't thrown down your phones, smashed them in the ground, and cursed my name, uh, let's, <laughs> let's talk about today's real sponsor. Today's time so is actually brought to you by Lisa. Uh, do you wake up feeling achy? Easily distracted, uh, forgetful. Do, do you wake up thinking I should I should get my family gathered together tomorrow and attack those damn troublesome neighbor folk? Do you wake up thinking it's time I start settling disputes with a fist or a knife or a pistol? Well, turns out you're not gonna get enough rest, sleepyhead. That's enough enough of that crazy talk. A quality night's sleep makes all the difference, and the right right mattress is the key to getting proper rest instead of just laying down. The Lisa mattress is a product of 30 years of experience, hundreds of hours of rigorous product testing. Designed for body contouring and pressure relief, the Lisa mattress is perfect for all sleepers. Shop conveniently online with free shipping and 100 nights to try the mattress in your own home. The Lisa mattress is backed by more than 12,000 five-star reviews, uh, loved by more than 300,000 happy sleepers. And Lisa also donates one mattress for every 10 sold, you know, to, to, to people who can't afford a mattress of their own, so you can sleep easy and feel good about your purchase. Uh, I've been getting solid sleep on my Lisa for a while now. Uh, it shows in how much I've been screaming in recent episodes. It shows in the enthusiasm I'm able to put into air banjo solos. See, that's, that's what sleep gets you. Uh, but seriously, your mind doesn't work right if you don't get enough rest. And, and the two inch Avena foam top layer plus another two inch memory foam layer, it keeps me perfectly positioned for my good night's rest. Uh, and right now, get $150 off the Lisa mattress plus a free pillow at lisa.com slash timesuck and enter promo code TIMESUCK at checkout. Uh, this is Lisa's best offer at lisa.com slash TIMESUCK, promo code TIMESUCK, L-E-E-S-A dot com slash TIMESUCK, promo code TIMESUCK. Do it! Yeah, yeah, yeah! Uh, and now let's talk about a lot of angry, crazy people who slept like shit in today's Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Fall of 1878. A hog. Hog folk! A real hog gets stolen. Maybe. We think. Uh, it's common practice for families to let their hogs roam the woods around their properties for, to forage for acorns and beech nuts. Each family would mark their particular hog uh, with a notch or mark in its ear. The animals would then be easily recognizable, not identified, and it could be rounded up again. Uh, in, in, in autumn of 1878, Randall McCoy, leader of the McCoys, visiting Floyd Hatfield, cousin of Devil Ann's at his farm, and there Randall claimed he saw a hog uh, bearing the earmark of McCoy penned up with the Hatfield animals. Ooh, I see what you're doing. Randall, uh, notoriously hot-tempered, immediately accuses Floyd Hatfield of stealing one of his animals, files a formal suit for the hog's recovery with Reverend Anderson Hatfield, the local justice of the peace, and a man who happens to be Devil Ann's first cousin. 
The matter goes to trial. In an attempt to keep the verdict fair, Anderson Hatfield selects a jury made up of six Hatfields and six McCoys. And then Bill Stanton, nephew of Randall McCoy, brother of Sarah Stanton, who was the wife of Ellison Hatfield, sister-in-law of Devil Lance, testified that the hog in question did indeed bear a Hatfield mark. And uh, he said he had per personally, personally witnessed Floyd Hatfield applying that mark. Man, damn conflicting family loyalties. All that. He didn't know which way. He didn't know which way to, 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 to which side to be on. That's why a dog folk ain't supposed to marry hog folk. Now you got some man connected to both families bound to piss off Ken on one side or another if he opened his full mouth. In a surprise verdict, the jury found Floyd Hatfield innocent of any wrongdoing because Selkirk McCoy, a cousin of Randall, apparently gave the swing vote for innocence. Oh, you done did it now. You betrayed your bloodline. The McCoys were outraged at the verdict and subsequently uh, ostracized Selkirk from the family. He's out now as a traitor uh, for supporting the Hatfields in this decision. And then he would just be aligned with the Hatfield clan in the future. I mean, these people were serious about, man, like so clannish. You know, you fight on which side of the, uh, the Civil War that our families decided to fight. Uh, you testify only on our behalf always. Uh, you, you don't, you'll find out later, you know, in this story that you don't date anybody from the other side. You do any of those things, you're fucking out for life. You're out of our family. That is so hardcore. I'll never understand something like that. Like, uh, there's people I don't like in the world, you know, but if Kyler or Monroe gotten involved with them, I wouldn't be like, you make your decision now, boy. You're with the Cummins clan or you are dead to me forever. People did shit like that all the time back then. Um, okay. So Selkirk. Yeah, he broke one of the first rules, speeding in the Klan, testifying, testifying against his own kind. Uh, in the months following the hog trial, hog theft witness Bill Stanton, now he's harassed and threatened by the McCoys for testifying on the behalf of Floyd Hatfield. And remember, he's, you know, vaguely related to the McCoys, but they're like, ah, uh, ah, uh, man, you testified against us. You couldn't keep your mouth shut. Uh, now there's, like, crazy confrontations between him and various McCoys that included gunfire. You know, he, he once, every once in a while, he's just riding around through the valley getting fucking shot at. Because he opened his mouth about a hog. Uh, but no serious harm was done initially. Just, just valley boys being valley boys. Just shooting one another. Uh, that's just how we settle our disagreements. Uh, until eventually a chance encounter between Bill Stanton and Sam and Paris McCoy, brothers of old Randall McCoy, leads to a shootout uh, ending in the serious wounding of Paris McCoy and in the murder of Bill Stanton. So now he gets killed for opening his mouth about the, about the hog. Uh, you try to testify now, Billy? You try to testify against our kin from hell, you Hatfield stooge. Sam McCoy uh, stands trial for Stanton's murder. And although the evidence and judicial system uh, seem very stacked against him, it seems very obvious that he did this. And also, you know, Devil Ann's own brother, Valentine Hatfield, is now the judge in this trial. So he's got a cousin, presiding, first cousin presiding in the last trial, over the last trial. Now, he's, now his brother is presiding as judge in this trial. Uh, but still... Sam found uh, not guilty by reason of self-defense. And some historians think this decision was handed down per the explicit instructions of Devil Ann's to diffuse tension between the two families and prevent further violence. You know, it's like, yes, yes, you know, he, okay, one of our kind was killed, but our kind did provoke him. Let's stop it now. And let's get back to making our timber money. Well, in spring 1880, some forbidden hog folk, dog folk romance gets the feud going again. Uh, adds, a, adds actually a, a whole heap of fire to the or whole, whole heap of fuel to the fire. Uh, Pike County held their local elections at the home of Jerry Hatfield that spring. Not not sure how Jerry is related to Devil Lance. There was a fucking billion Hatfields and McCoys in this tale. And, uh, you know, the the articles about, about all these different situations don't always uh, talk about how, like, some random person was related to the next. They had the same last name, guessing his cousin of some sort. Um, so, yeah, so uh, they host the uh, election at the home of Jerry Hatfield. Uh... Him hosting election shindig seems to be his only contribution to the legend of this feud. His name doesn't come up again. And it was common for, for the home of a wealthy person to be used as a local polling place. Elections were big social events, more social than they were political at this time in this area. Uh, women would make all kinds of food and refreshments. Candidates would supply ample amounts of whiskey, uh, both of uh, legal whiskey and of the moonshine variety. Both the Hatfields and the McCoys were fond of making uh, moonshine. Uh, John Z. Hatfield, one of Devil Ann's son, was a big moonshine maker in the area. Um, people would come out early, the men would vote, and then on the, the family would spend an entire day socializing with their peers. And on this election day, the West Virginia Hatfields also come over to Pike County to visit their Kentucky kin, visit some friends, drink some moonshine. Uh, Devil Ann's himself shows up with his sons, John Z. and Cap, 
And it was during the course of the day that John Z, a notorious local ladies' man, meets Rose Anna McCoy, uh, daughter of old Randall McCoy, considered to be one of the most beautiful girls in the county. Oh, shit. Got a, got a classic backwoods Romeo and Juliet situation kicking off now. Star-crossed hillbillies, John Z. Montague, pursuing Rosanna Capulet. Uh, didn't end well for Romeo and Juliet and their families, and you can imagine it will not end well here. It's unclear exactly what transpired between them, but after spending the day together, they disappeared from the party uh, for a good amount of time, only returning at dusk. So I'm guessing they did it. Strongly guessing they did it. Uh, Hail Lucifina, I'd say Vegas Odds, uh, says that a Hatfield penis shook carnal hands with a McCoy vagina that day. Uh, I doubt they took off into the woods, you know, uh, to get away from the wedding party for hours to play a, a secret game of chess or to do some, some catfish fishing. Uh, Rosanna was anxious at the thought of facing her dad after disappearing with a Hatfield boy for hours. Especially, uh, yeah, she's, a, she's an unwed virgin and she may, she may have tainted, tainted herself with this Hatfield boy. Uh, so instead of returning uh, to her family home, she goes back to the Hatfields, goes back to West Virginia. Spends night there. And, and then John D expresses his desire to marry Rosanna, and Devil Ann forbids it. He's not having it. He's furious. And then word gets back to old Randall McCoy. He's furious as well. This Hatfield boy has stolen his family's honor. Uh, Randolph, uh, old Randall even sent uh, three of his other daughters to retrieve Rosanna uh, initially, but then she defied her family's wishes, remained with the Hatfields for several months. Seems she only left when it became clear that John Z had no real intention of marrying her because his family uh, forbid it, is what most historians think. Other historians attribute this to John Z being a notorious playboy. Uh, despite the strong objections of both families, John Z uh, continues to court Rosanna at the house of her Aunt Betty Blankenship McCoy in Kentucky. After she returns to uh, Kentucky, you know, uh, enraging the McCoys further, uh, also, it's possible, there, there's no official documentation of this, but some historians think that uh, Rosanna became pregnant with John Z's baby. Uh, old Randall uh, and three of his sons, they ambush John Z and Rosanna one night during one of their little lovers' get-togethers. Uh, Going to teach John Z a lesson. Rosanna, fearing that her dad is going to kill John Z, borrows a horse from a neighbor, rides to West Virginia to tell the Hatfields what's going on. Doesn't want her, her dad to kill the man she loves. Devil Ann's, his son Cap, his brothers Ellison and Elias, along with Uncle Jim Vance, crazy Uncle Jim, and family friends Tom Chambers and Moses Christian ride off to reclaim John Z, and they overtake the McCoys, rescue John Z without any violence at this time. Uh, this does mark the end of the relationship between John Z and Rosanna, and also marks the end of Rosanna's relationship with her father Randall, who now completely disowns her. Uh, oh, John Z, John Z, wherefore art thou, John Z? Deny thy father and refuse thy name, or if thou wilt not, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a dog folk, McCoy. Shall I hear more, or shall I speak at this? Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, thou not a hog folk, Hatfield. Star-crossed lovers. Ding, 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 ding. Despite all this trouble, John Z, not quite done chasing McCoy women. He's done with Rosanna, but he's going to go after another McCoy now. This dude. Uh, he ends up having a quick courtship and then marrying Nancy McCoy, who is Rose and his cousin. Daughter of the previously murdered Aza Harmon McCoy, that guy, that Union sympathizer. Uh, uh, and, th and they get um, married on May 14th, 1881. Oh, man, so many, so many constant interconnections here. And I'm going to repeat family, uh, like how they're related, because if not, this story gets real fucking confusing real fast. Um, Harmon, again, again the, the, the Union soldier disowned by his McCoy family. Uh, rumored to have been killed by Uncle Jim Vance, rumored to have been killed by the devil, Anse himself, and now that guy's daughter is marrying, uh, you know, devil Anse's son. Uh, now, if you're, if you're wondering why John Z would be so foolish, to be fair to him, there was not a tremendous uh, amount of single women in the area. Even less that weren't, you know, closely related to him. And while cousin love and clearly not forbidden, also not necessarily your first choice. So, so maybe he kept chasing McCoy women because there just weren't that many other options. Or going back to education levels in the area, maybe he really was just fucking dumb. Uh, despite all this romantic drama, things settled down following John Z's wedding for a little over a year. Nancy's brother, Jeff, uh, is frequently crossing into West Virginia now to visit his sister and her Hatfield family for a while without issue. Uh, the Hatfields spend a decent amount of time in P Pike County with no trouble, no big trouble. And, and then the relative peace will end on another election day, August 7th, 1882. Uh, this election also held at the home of uh, Jerry Hatfield. So I guess he, I guess he reappears in the story in the sense uh, 
uh, his house is used to get. Uh, and the West Virginia Hatfields, again, crossed the river to, to visit their family and enjoy the festivities. Uh, among the West Virginia contingent this time is Devil Ann's brother Ellison and Elias and their cousin, another Elias, Bad Elias Hatfield, uh, Bad Elias and Devil Ann's. You don't get nicknames like that for being the friendliest, most hospitable fellas in the region. I wonder, I wonder how many other, like, uh, you know, Bad uh, Hatfield nicknames have been lost to history. I wish I had a whole list of all of them. I'm Devil Ames, and this is my cousin, Bad Lath. And this is my other, this is my other kin. This is my uncle, Crazy Jim. This, this is my brother here. This is uh, Evil uh, Ellison. Uh, this is my nephew here. This is Strangling Sam. I'd also like to introduce you to my second cousin, uh, Terrible Timmy. Uh, my second cousin once removed. Uh, this is Raping Ricky. Don't stand too close to him. This is my brother, Throat Punching Paul. Gotta keep your eye on him as well. He's troublesome. He's this is my third cousin twice removed. Uh, scoop your eye out with the rusty spoon and eat it in front of you. Pop it like a ripe grape in between his teeth, Terrence. And he insists. I will. I cannot emphasize this enough. He insists on being addressed by his full nickname. You will say it in its entirety, or he will display to you exactly how he got that nickname. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. As the nickname suggests, uh, Bad Lies had a reputation for his hot temper, bad disposition. After a long day drinking at this election party, uh, one, of, one of old Randall's many sons, Tolbert McCoy, accuses Bad Lies of owing him an outstanding debt for a fiddle. <laughs> of course it's a fiddle. Uh, only thing better would be a banjo in this story. Uh, which Bad Lies uh, vehemently denies. An argument breaks out, quickly settled by Bad Lies' his more even-tempered brother, Deacon Anderson Hatfield. Right, that, that judge, uh, despite efforts to keep the peace, arguments continue throughout the day uh, until a passing comment from Ellison to Tolbert sparks another fight. Right, now we got Hatfield and McCoy fight happen, a little, little fist fight, starts off as a fist fight, and then Tolbert uh, takes out a knife and attacks Ellison with it and slashes open his stomach. These people are fucking animals. Knife to the stomach over a, a possible fiddle debt. That's about the most backwoods type of squabble I've ever heard of. Damn you, Stephen Hogfolk Hatfields! I done told you! I get my fiddle nickels, or I open up your damn hog guts. I will spill your Hatfield hog guts all over this here mud if you don't give me my fiddle nickels. Uh, when Ellison fights back, two of Tolbert's brothers join in. Now it's three on one. Uh, Ellison's been attacked by three McCoys. I'm sure everyone's just sitting around laughing, watching this, drinking some moonshine. Ellison grabs a rock to defend himself and then ends up getting stabbed 26 fucking times. 26 times. And then gets finished off when, uh, Farmer McCoy shoots him in the back. Farmer, another son of, uh, of old Randall. So shit escalates big time. Uh... Now Elias, bad Elias Hatfield, grabs the gun, tries to return fire, you know, shoots at the McCoy brothers, but they take off into the woods. Can't, can't get a shot off, uh, or can't get an effective shot off. Uh, th but then they do get captured shortly thereafter by two justices of the peace, Joseph and Tolbert Hatfield and Constable Matthew Hatfield. So many fucking Hatfields. Feels like there's about a thousand Hatfields in the Tug River Valley. Uh, the bullet uh, wounds Ellison gravely, does not, does not kill him right away. And he's taken to a friend's home. The West Virginia Hatfields uh, notified of the assault. Valentine Wall Hatfield, Ellison's brother, assembles a posse to head to Kentucky the next day, find those dirty dog folk McCoys, exact some uh, righteous, you know, vengeance upon them. Uh, the following day on August 8th, the Hatfield posse on their way to Pikesville receives word that the McCoy brothers have been arrested by local authorities. Um, so, which is confusing to me. Uh, yeah, so I guess these justices of the peace were, were <laughs> related to them. Oh, man. And I have gone over this so many times to try and separate the families. It, they're so... Uh, anyway, I guess what's important in this little segment of the tale is whether or not these well, it's, uh, these these uh, local law officers were Hatfields or not. Local law officers get them, but then some, some Hatfields, possibly some other Hatfields, think like, no, we don't want this uh, to go through the court. They form a posse. They get these three McCoy sons uh, in some vigilante kind of takedown. Right, and then they take them back to uh, um, one of their homes. So they take take custody of them. Uh, they have them in West Virginia. Uh, they put them actually in an abandoned log schoolhouse. There we go, under under armed guard. And then that night, Randall's wife, the boy's mother, Sarah McCoy, her daughter-in-law Mary Butcher arrive, beg to see their kin. Devil Ants relents. The women get to spend a fair amount of time with the McCoy boys. Supposedly, Sarah pleads with Devil Ants not to kill her sons. He promises her he will return them to Kentucky soil alive. But then 
the following day, August 9th, Devil Anz's brother Ellison dies, and Devil Anz is enraged, he's grieving, he decides he is not going to return Sarah's boys to her, not after killing his brother. Uh, she returns again to see her son, she is denied, and then the McCoy prisoners are bound and marched to the Tug Fork, where they cross the river, they're returned to Kentucky soil, uh, where the Hatfields, some Hatfields, tie to some bushes, cross the creek to go back to the West Virginia side, and then from across the creek, open fire on the bound prisoners, uh, fire well over 50 shots. They're, they're, you know, very dead. The bodies of Tolbert, Farmer, and Bud McCoy then discovered on the riverbank the next day by a relative. Yeah, and at any of these points, I have to do a little bit like, wait, what? Uh, there's there's uh, a, lot of, a lot of tales out there about these guys. And, uh, and it's a very fusing tale, even when you do get down to the truth. And uh, yeah, it takes a lot of like, wait, what? I have to be very clear. Wait, wait, what am I saying now? Um, so if you're keeping track, let's do a recap because this, this shit is getting confusing. If you're keeping track of significant hostilities, let's go over the important points before we move forward in this tale. Aza Harmon McCoy, thought to have been killed by some Hatfields, likely by either Devil Ants or Crazy Uncle Jim Vance in 1865. And Aza Harmon McCoy is Randall McCoy, old Randall, head of the McCoy clan. It's his brother the brother that was ostracized by the family for being a Union soldier. That's 1865. Uh, 1878, Randall McCoy accuses Floyd Hatfield, cousin of Devil Ants, of uh, stealing one of his hogs. Floyd found innocent, but the trial may not have been that fair. Uh, a shootout over the hog dispute a few months later leads to Paris McCoy, son of Randall, getting wounded, and Bill Stanton, relative of both the Hatfields and the McCoys, but a man closer in uh, community ties to the Hatfields, getting killed himself uh, in 1880. John Z. Hatfield, one of Devil Ann's sons, hooks up in the woods with Rose Anna McCoy, one of Randall's daughters. Uh, Randall will end up disowning her uh, over the romance. 1881, John Z. Hatfield courts and marries Rose Anna's cousin Nancy McCoy, daughter of the just previously mentioned Aza Harmon McCoy. 1882, Three McCoy boys stab and shoot Devil Ends' brother Ellison Hatfield. Posse forms leading to the uh, to three of Randall's nine sons, uh, Tolbert Farmer and Bud McCoy, getting executed in a display of Hatfield vigilante justice. So so far, it seems that Randall McCoy is getting the shittiest end of the feud stick by far. His brother. Uh, Aza Harmon, likely killed by Hatfield, possibly by Devil Ants. Another brother, Paris, wounded in a gunfight. Um, uh, his, his daughter has... Okay, yeah. My God, I have to constantly keep going over this in my head. Um, yes, uh, another brother, Paris McCoy. Yes, wounded in a gunfight. His daughter, her reputation soiled by an unmarried carnal union with the son of Devil Ants. His nephew, Bill Stanton, um, killed in a shootout with Hatfields. Uh, three of his sons... Killed by a vigilante posse led by Devil Ants. Uh, brother, nephew, three sons killed. A daughter and niece seduced by a Hatfield. Five dead, one wounded, uh, two virginities taken. Meanwhile, Devil Ants has lost one brother and his clan uh, has been accused of stealing a hog. So very lopsided. Hog, hog folk, uh, Hatfield's way up on dog folk McCoy's through the summer of 1882. Okay. August 10th, 1882. Both Ellison Hatfield and his now dead McCoy brother murderers are buried. Uh, shortly thereafter, Judge George N. Brown of Pike County, Kentucky, convenes a grand jury to determine the identities of the killers of the McCoy brothers. After 10 days of deliberation, the jury, with neither a Hatfield nor McCoy on it, returns indictments against 20 men, including Devil Ants, his brothers Wall and Elias, his sons Cap and Johnsy, a number of other well-known Hatfield supporters. And that, and that, those three murders just would, will keep coming up. Like, the, the legal reper repercussions keep this feud going for a long time, because... You know, they're just continually not brought to justice. Uh, despite the indictments, no arrests are made uh, in the murder of the McCoy uh, sons in, in the four years uh, afterwards, from 1882 and 1886. And that goes back to what we said earlier about, you know, uh, states being very reluctant to, to pursue uh, supposed fugitives of justice in other states. Uh, the Hatfields and McCoys would occasionally take uh, little, little pot shots at one another during this time, so the feud's still on. They still shoot at each other from time to time, but no one's killed. Uh, members of both families do continue to cross back and forth over the state line between Kentucky and West Virginia. Uh, Devil Ann's involvement with the feud lessens. His son Cap started, kind of takes the reins as the leader of the Hatfield clan, at least in terms of their conflict with the McCoys. Old Randall McCoy, still bent on vengeance in the death of his sons. 
Uh, he hires an attorney he's related to by marriage, that man, Perry Klein, that guy that, uh, you know, Devil Ann's got all those acres from way back when. Uh, to represent, and, he, and he hires Perry to represent the McCoy family in their quest for justice. Uh, Perry Klein, brother-in-law of the murdered Harmon McCoy, old Randall's brother, and he, and he clearly has a personal vendetta as well against the Hatfields. Uh, at some point during this time period, things start to go wrong in the marriage of Nancy McCoy and John Z. Hatfield. Uh, apparently, Nancy was a notorious gossip who found the details of the feud fascinating. Yeah, why? of course she did. Uh, she and her sister, Mary Daniels, frequently discussed the details of the feud. This convinced the Hatfields that she was a spy, or that I guess both of them were a spy, her and her sister, and that they're informing, uh, uh, you know, um, Hatfield secrets to the McCoys, not trusting the women's husbands to punish them accordingly for this. This is insane. Cap Hatfield, again, one of Devil Ann's sons, and Tom Wallace, the Hatfield supporter, burst into Mary's home one night, uh, hold her husband at gunpoint, and then lash uh, first marry, then her daughter with a cow's tail. Just whip them like a couple of mules. Again, these people are fucking savage. Uh, Cap and Tom Wallace warn the women to stay at home, mind their own business going forward. Neither do, and the story of the assault rapidly circulates throughout the community. <laughs> ah, sometime in the fall of 1886, Nancy and Mary's brother Jeff McCoy stabs and then shoots a Pike County mail carrier named Fred Wolford. Uh, Jeff is John Z. Hatfield's wife's brother, son of Aza Harmon McCoy. Uh, Jeff flees to Kentucky to Nancy's home in West Virginia to hide out from the law. And there he learns about Mary and her daughter getting whipped by Cap Hatfield and Tom Wallace. And Jeff is outraged. Hot folk don't whip no dog folk. Uh, he decides to punish Hatfield associate Tom Wallace. Uh, maybe he's a little bit you know, hesitant to, uh, to go after Cap Hatfield directly. Well, Jeff, along with an accomplice named Josiah Hurley, they wait until Cap is out of his house, then kidnap Tom Wallace, take him to jail in Pikeville, Kentucky, he, uh, however, Tom Wallace manages to escape and return to Cap's house. Jeff and Josiah uh, catch up to him, but after a short confrontation, they give up. And then when Cap learns about the assault on his home and, and Wallace being taken, he files a complaint with the local justice of the, of the peace, his relation, who issues warrants for the arrest, appoints Cap as special constable. How convenient. He gets, uh, he gets to become a law officer, you know, uh, so that he can serve the warrants himself. So now he gets to go after McCoy somewhat legally, quasi-legally. And he does arrest Jeff McCoy and Josiah Hurley, but then Jeff escapes, quote-unquote, during transport to county jail. Uh, he dives into the tug fork, tries to swim back to Kentucky. Uh, he does make it to the riverbank, where then Cap just shoots him from across the river, and he dies. So another McCoy, a nephew of old Randall, has been shot and killed by a Hatfield. Hogfolk, still, still way up in this feud. All right. In the wake of yet another killing, Devil Ants tries to soothe the, the bad blood between the two families on December 26, 1886, uh, day after Christmas. Devil Ants writes a letter to McCoy attorney Perry Klein, assuring him that the Hatfields were very sorry for all the trouble uh, and that he would have prevented the violence if he could have. And not surprisingly, the feud continues. Yeah, I, I, feel, like, I, I feel like we've gone way past the point of an apology letter to clean everything up right now, right? Just... Uh, dearest old Randall McCoy, I, I profusely apologize for the death of another one of your filthy dog folk kin. I know that the past few years have been hard on you, uh, with us Hatfields continually whooping upon you, McCoy, so so severely and so consistently. Uh, sometimes our lopsided feud uh, looks like a big, strong, grown man fighting a tiny, sickly baby. Must be hard to think about how, how uh, you know, took three of your boys to bring my brother down and then your boys were, were then killed, uh, you know, soon for that. Uh, I hear your daughter Rosanna is still unwed. That's a pity. She was so beautiful. And now, it, now it'll be hard to find a man willing to make a meal out of my son John's leftovers. Anywho, sorry for my clan killing another one of your kin. Uh, deepest condolences, Devil Ends, Hatfield, P.S., we did steal your motherfucking hog, and I did kill your brother Aza Harmon. Hatfields forever. Uh, probably, a, probably a little bit like nicer letter than that one, but it, uh, but it still <laughs> doesn't end the feud. In the spring of 1887, Jacob and Larkin McCoy, sons of Aza Harmon, nephews of Old Randall, brothers to Nancy, Mary, and Jeff. God dang, man! I feel like I need to have one of those detective things, like. Uh, like in their in their war room where they have like all the different people on the wall and then just lots of fucking string connecting everybody. <laughs> anyway, spring of 1887, Jacob Larkin McCoy, sons of Aza Harmon, nephews of old Randall, brothers to Nancy, Mary, and Jeff, cross the river into West Virginia to capture Cap Hatfield and Tom Wallace for the murder of their brother Jeff. 
Uh, they only managed to apprehend Tom Wallace, take him to Pike County Jail, and after a week of incarceration, he escapes, of course. Uh, people escaped all the time from jail back then. We've talked about that a lot here in the suck. And then a, a short time later, maybe his escape was convenient too. Maybe they wanted to let him out uh, to get some uh, vigilante justice because a short time later, he's found dead in West Virginia. Identity of his killer or killers does remain unknown, but his death, all like, in all likelihood, caused by Jacob and Larkin McCoy, either directly or indirectly. So, so small possible victory, probable victory for the McCoy dog book. They didn't kill a Hatfield, but they did kill a Hatfield associate. In the summer of 1887, Simon Bolivar Buckner, running on the Democratic ticket for governor of Kentucky, uh, McCoy family attorney Perry Klein reaches out to Buckner, promises to uh, lend him the, the political support of the McCoy clan. Not an insubstantial number of people in exchange for his intervention in the various cases and indictments pending against the Hatfields. So, you know, he's trying to, he's still pissed about that 5,000 acres and he's, he's trying to, you know, basically bribe the governor to, uh, we'll help you become governor of Kentucky and then you will help us squash these fucking Hatfields. Uh, and Buckner is receptive to the idea and then is elected governor of Kentucky in August 1887. So this is a win for the McCoys. The Hatfields, understandably concerned about this arrangement, they organized a local vigilante group called the Logan County Regulators to defend themselves from Kentucky aggression. Uh, the regulators write a letter to Perry Klein on August 29th, 1897, addressing their concerns about the state of Kentucky's possible interference in the Hatfield cases. And this is a real letter this time, not my silly horse shit. And it does really speak to the power and just the uh, arrogance of the Hatfields in the Valley, just their badassery, I guess, at this time. Uh, the name starts off, or the letter starts off, my name is Nat Hatfield. And I, this is another Hatfield where I am unclear exactly how he is related to Devil Ants. Not a lot of info on him. Uh, and nothing, no info I can find that pertains to his direct relation. Probably another cousin again. And Nat writes, I am not a single individual by a good many. And we do not live on Togue River, but we live all over this county. We have been told by men from your county that you and your men are fixing to invade this county for the purpose of taking the Hatfield boys. And now, sir, we, 49 in number at present, do notify you that if you come into this county to take or bother any of the Hatfields, we will follow you to hell or take your hide. And if any of the Hatfields are killed or bothered in any way, we will charge it up to you and your hide will pay the penalty. We are not bothering you and neither are the Hatfields. And as long as you keep your hands off Logan County men, we will not do anything. But if you don't keep your hands off our men, there is not one of you will be left in six months. There is present at this time 49 of the men who regulated matters at this place a short time ago. And we can get as many as we need in six hours. We have a habit of making one horse loyals keep their boots on. And we have plenty of good strong rope left. And our hangman tied a knot for you and laid it quietly away until we see what you do. We have no particular pleasure in hanging dogs. But we know you and have counted the miles and marked the tree. That dog reference was real, by the way. Dog folk! I made that part up, but they were calling dogs. Man, <laughs> that is a very, very threatening letter. Uh, yeah, if, if you missed out on any part of that, he is uh, in, in no uncertain terms... Letting the McCoy family attorney know, if you fuck with us in any way, we will hang you till you are fucking dead, and we will wipe out the McCoy clan. Uh, Perry Klein wisely does not take this letter to the authorities. Uh, until the autumn of 1887, uh, the Hatfield-McCoy feud essentially is uh, limited to the families. Little intervention with the authorities in either Pike or Logan counties. Uh, not a lot of big events uh, transpiring. But then with the election of Governor Buckner, the feud uh, becomes embroiled in state politics. Uh, and this pushes the feud into its uh, most violent period. Governor Buckner keeps his promise to Perry Klein to intervene in the case against the Hatfields. Despite the letter, you know, the governor is uh, uh, going to still try to pursue some kind of justice against uh, the Hatfields. On September 10, 1887, he makes a formal requisition to West Virginia Governor Emanuel Wilson, uh, Willis Wilson. That's an unfortunate uh, name. Governor Emanuel Willis Wilson. Oh, Willis Wilson! Oh, Willie Will! Uh, for the extradition of Devil Ants and 19 others to Kentucky to answer for charges of Randall, Randolph McCoy's three sons being killed way back in 1882 there. You know, he's, he's still insistent on justice for that. On September 30th, Governor Wilson denies the request on the basis of a missing affidavit from Pike County authorities. 
On, on October 13th, Governor Buckner then sends the affidavit. Uh, West Virginia's Governor Wilson is not a stupid man. He takes his time responding to Kentucky. Uh, on November 21st, he finally does write back to, to the Kentucky governor stating that he will he will honor the requisition for all of the parties named except for Elias Hatfield and Andrew Varney. He said uh, neither had satisfactory, satisfactorily demonstrated that they were involved in the murders. Perry Klein then does, despite that letter uh, that he'd gotten earlier, does have ben bench warrants issued. Then on December 12th, the first arrest is made. So Kirk McCoy, uh, that deciding juror back in that hog case, uh, is arrested, is jailed. Uh, the next day, Klein sends an amended requisition to Governor uh, Wilson requesting only the warrants for Devilands, Johnsy, Cap, Daniel Witten, Albert McCoy, uh, son of Silkirk, uh, so a McCoy who's on the Hatfield side. Uh, Perry Klein urges Governor Buckner to induce the state of Kentucky to offer large monetary rewards for the capture and the arrest of the West Virginia Hatfields. And then, as Perry Klein, man, it's amazing that he didn't die in this tale. Uh, Perry Klein extorts money, 225 bucks, from some of the Hatfields, promising to use that money to bribe the Kentucky Governor Buckner to withdraw, you know, the uh, the warrants. And uh, multiple witnesses confirm this arrangement, including attorneys A.J. Oxier, James York, who had both been present at a meeting between John Z and, and Perry Klein in December 1887 when the deal was made. Uh, despite learning of Klein's double dealing, Kentucky Governor Buckner determined to end the feud. December 1887, he addresses the state legislature in Kentucky, condemning the uh, feudists, condemning the feudists, and uh, the violence. He says, "The law-abiding character of the people of Kentucky, estimated by others in a great measure, not from the general disposition of its citizens to obey the laws, but from the violent conduct of comparatively a few lawless individuals. If from neglect or inefficiency we fail to repress this lawlessness, or bring the offenders to justice." We have no right to complain of the false estimation in which we are held by people of other states. So, you know, what he's saying here is, uh, you know, I I'm sick of Kentucky being looked at as a bunch of fucking backwoods hillbillies as an entire state because of the actions of this one uh, family feuding with another family. And then in, in private, he probably said, Damn those infernal hillbillies! I wish the Tug River Valley would split wide open enough to unlatch a porter to hell itself and pull both hog folk and dog folk into its eternal flames. Uh, the Hatfields see uh, Governor Buckner's headlines, uh, hardline stance excuse me, on the feud as both a personal threat uh, and also as an insult. I guess they also see it as evidence that the McCoys are using political connections in the state to pursue them unjustly despite their warnings. And then late December, the Hatfields hold a council yeah, and decide the only way to end their persecution was to eliminate the head of the snake, eliminate Randall McCoy, and all the members of his family who might testify against them if they were brought to trial in Pike County. They were kidding about that letter earlier. Perry, you know, uh, fails to take it seriously. Perry Klein, the, the McCoys, fail to take it seriously. And they're like, all right, you guys aren't going to leave us alone. We're going to fucking come after you now. Like, like really come after you. Uh, all of the men, including Jim Vance, Cap, John Z, Tomb Chambers, all, everybody agrees to the, the plan uh, to go after the McCoys. Except possibly Devil Ancy may or may not have agreed. Uh, he was he was sick at the time, used his bad health as an excuse not to take part in their plan, and leadership falls to Jim Vance. Many think that Devil Ants uh, didn't want what's about to happen to happen, at least not in the way it's going to. So it's, so it's on. It's on now. Uh, uh, so now, in the most cold-blooded event of the feud so far, Jim Vance, along with Cap, John Z. Bobbley, Elliot Hart Hatfield, son of Ellison, Tomb Chambers, Ellison Mounts, who is the, uh, the, the bastard son of uh, Devil Lanza's brother, uh, who was stabbed and shot earlier in the story, Charles Gillespie, uh, French Doc Ellis. They launch a midnight attack on the McCoy household, New Year's Day, 1888. So happy New Year's, McCoy! The Hatfield shitstorm been surrounding you for years, just turned into a shit NATO. Uh, you caught in the vortex, you caught in the brown eye of the Hatfield storm. Under the cover of darkness, the Hatfields surround the house, demand that the McCoy men surrender. Old Randall and his son Calvin refuse. They take up defense, defensive positions inside the house against orders to withhold fire. Johnsy starts shooting into the house. In the ensuing gun battle, Crazy Jim Vance, Tom Chambers set fire to the house. Uh, one of Randall McCoy's young daughters, Alifair, shot as she opens the kitchen door to try to get out of a burning house. Uh, by the way, if you have seen the History Channel Hatfield and McCoy miniseries drama, which is excellent, uh, is historically accurate for the most part. Uh, she was not a young child as she was portrayed in that in that docu series. She or miniseries. She was she's 29, possibly even 30. 
Uh, half of the sources say one, half say the other. So she gets shot coming out of the burning house, and then her mother, Sarah McCoy, uh, goes to try to aid her, her dying daughter, and then Jim Vance strikes her repeatedly with the butt of his rifle. Uh, despite her injuries, she continues to try to help out affair, and then Johnsy, uh, you know, the, the dude who wanted to be uh, her son-in-law while back in this tale, pistol whips the fucking shit out of her uh, to a point she will never mentally recover. Uh, man, John Z pistol whipping the mother of the woman he dated for months, supposedly wanted to marry, pistol whipping the aunt of his current wife. Uh, the fire spreads. Calvin McCoy tries to make a run for the, uh, for some corn. He gets shot. Uh, you know, one of Randall's sons, old Randall, he's able to escape into the woods. At this point, the Hatfield party realizes, uh, not only had they failed at their plan to, uh, to kill old Randall, they had made their situation far worse. They had escalated in a shit that they probably, uh, in, in a way that they probably had not imagined. Uh, both Calvin and Alifair are dead, so two more, two more of Randall, you know, McCoy's uh, kids, five of his kids now, have been killed in this feud. Sarah, his wife, gravely wounded with a broken arm, broken hip, and crushed skull. Uh, yeah, and she would be uh, brain damaged for the rest of her life. Uh, much of the property was also destroyed, forcing Randall to move in with his uh, uh, remaining family in the Pikeville uh, home of Perry Klein. Uh, there, the formerly disowned daughter, Rosanna, goes over and takes care of her beaten mother. God, man, Randall's getting the worst of this feud. Holy shit. Hatfields have now uh, yeah, killed four of his sons, one of his daughters, killed a pair of his nephews, beat his wife almost to death, burned his fucking house down, killed his brother years back. Meanwhile, the only blood kin that Devil Ants has lost is his brother Ellison in this feud uh, to this point. You know, the midnight attack on the McCoy farm, uh, this, is, this is the event that first drew national attention to the feud. Newspapers all over the region running sensationalized headlines about the event, the feud in general. Uh, January of 1888, Frank Phillips, Pike County Sheriff's Deputy, official agent of Governor Buckner in the Hatfield matter, ally of the McCoys, assembles a party of 27 men to go into West Virginia and, and chase down the Hatfields. Taking the Hatfields by surprise, Phillips and his posse do capture Cap, uh, and they actually kill Jim Vance, shooting him in the stomach and then in the head. So now Devil Ants has lost a, a you know, second blood kin. Uh, dog folk getting a wee bit of payback on them damn hot folk now. Killed Devil Ants' brother and his uncle. Uh, throughout the first part of January, Phillips and his men would occasionally cross into West Virginia for more short raids, hoping to repeat the success in taking Cap and, and killing Jim Vance. Uh, but then on January 19th, Phillips and his men find themselves in a much bigger conflict than they expected. In what would become known as the Battle on Grapevine Creek, Phillips and 18 of his men... Many of them McCoys find themselves in a fucking battle, almost like a military battle with 13 Hatfield men, uh, who themselves carried a warrant for the, the, the arrest for the murders of Jim Vance. So you see, like, this keeps happening. Like, you know, West Virginia's like, all right, all right, we didn't like they killed people in our land that we didn't okay, uh, you know, so we don't recognize them as lawmen, so now you guys need to be lawmen. So each side has warrants for the other side. Each side will, you know, uh, think that they have the law on their side when they're fighting. This shit is just crazy. During the battle, there's several deaths on each side. Uh, none of them directly related to either Devil Ants, Hatfield, or Randall McCoy. Uh, Phillips did capture a number of Hatfield partisans, though, in the battle, including Wall Hatfield, Tom Chambers, Elias Mitchell, uh, Andrew Varney, uh, L.S. McCoy, son of Selkirk, Moses Christian, Sam Mahan, Doc Mahan, and Pliant Mahan. In the aftermath of the Battle of Grapevine Creek, West Virginia offers rewards for the capture of Phillips and 21 members of his posse. You know, the state's considering them to be acting illegally in Logan County. So this feud's really gotten big now, man. This is this is uh, in, in, in bringing in lawmen from each side. You know, this is causing like a fucking battle. Uh, you know, you got West Virginia offering rewards for Kentucky law officers. You know, you got, uh, you know, Kentucky offering rewards for, I guess, what are essentially now West Virginia law officers. Back and forth, back and forth. Um, ah, man, I, I, I get, I get why this story has captured so many people's imagination for so long. You know, I think, I think most of us have had a dispute with a neighbor, or at the very least had a neighbor we really don't care for. But now imagine, to kind of under personalize this a little bit, imagine you have a huge family that you're super close with, and that your entire family hates a neighbor and their family. And then basically your family declares war on this neighboring family. And now imagine there's, say, like a city, county, or state line dividing your properties, and that local law enforcement actually supports you waging war on your neighbor. And then that local area's law enforcement supports that neighbor war <laughs> waging war back on you. God, I mean, I think about this neighbor Chuck I had that I had a screaming match, uh, screaming match with before he moved out. Like, what if just me, instead of yelling at him, I just fucking shot at him and then didn't get in trouble? 
at least not right away, you know, uh, even though everybody knows about it. And then he shoots back at me, and then I have my dad and some uncles and some cousins come over and just raid his fucking house. Have a shootout, you know, set his house on fire, kill a couple of his uh, re relation, beat his wife half to death. This really happened with these people. They essentially waged war on fellow citizens, and the battle rages for over a decade. Uh, the Battle of Grapevine Creek finally ended the marriage of John Z. Hatfield and Nancy McCoy. I can't believe it lasted this long. Uh, Nancy then returns, returns home to her, her family in Kentucky and, act and actually marries Pike County Sheriff's Deputy Frank Phillips, the man who'd been pursuing all the Hatfields in West Virginia. Ah! It's, there's, it's, it's such a fucking soap opera. Marries the man hunting her husband and husband's family. Marries the man who sought justice for the Hatfields who had killed numerous members of her family. How crazy is this shit? Uh, marries the man whose father, uh, you know, and or great uncle were, uh, or yeah, she had married, excuse me, the man whose father and or great uncle uh, were rumored to have killed her dad. She had married the man, you know, previously Johnsy, who participated in the execution of several of her first cousins. Remained married to him. Uh, you know, when, when his family killed her brother, remained married to him when he pistol whipped her aunt, participated in the, in the shootout, killed a few more of her first cousins. I can only imagine what kind of marital arguments they had. You know, uh, I can't, I can't take you continually moping about the cabin, Nance. You can't keep dwelling on the past. Let's have, let's have a picnic or something, man. Enjoy a sunny day down by the river. And what will we talk about, Jonesy? Will we talk about which of my kin? Your crazy-ass dad plans on killing next? Will we talk about what my aunt did to deserve your pistol whipping? Maybe we could discuss what it felt like to burn down my family's home. Or what my brother said before your kin killed him. Or who killed my daddy, your father, or your uncle. All right, Nance. All right, Nance. That's enough. I, I hear you. You make a lot of good points. Maybe we shouldn't talk about nothing. Maybe we should just quietly fornicate or something along those lines. Uh, yeah, how the fuck did they ever get married and stay married? Around this time, Johnsy's former lover, Rose Anna McCoy, she dies of some unknown illness, probably of a broken soul. Uh, old Randall McCoy and his wife, Sarah, lose yet another child. These people are cursed. Uh, news newspapers around the region publish accounts of this new battle, draw more attention to the feud. The Wheeling Intelliger declares if, if one half of the stories of brutality and murder are true, the case would seem to warrant the authorities of both states in taking hold and ending the trouble, even if it is necessary to call the state troops into action. So a lot of people getting very sick of this feud. In late January, Pike County Judge Tobias Wagner, County Attorney Lee Ferguson, personally visit Kentucky Governor Buckner to request that state troops are indeed deployed to protect Pike County. But Buckner refuses to do so, suggesting instead that local citizenry assemble a militia to deal with the situation. Yeah, because that's been working out real well. Uh, at the same time in West Virginia, a delegation from Logan County petitions West Virginia Governor Wilson to either provide troops for the county's defense or provide them with arms to defend themselves. Both Logan and Pike County officials believe that the situation in the Tug Valley has now gone beyond a mere family blood feud and requires greater intervention on the part of the state, and then neither state is willing to provide that. Uh, the events of January 1888 uh, aggravate the relationship between the governors of West Virginia and Kentucky, uh, especially in the wake of Grapevine Creek. Uh, Governor Wilson, you know, he resists uh, complying with Kentucky's request for extradition of the Hatfields. Instead, he suggests that both states send independent agents into Logan and Pike counties to try to get to the truth of the matter, then work together to suppress violence in the Tug Valley. Uh, while this joint investigation is a good idea in theory, it does nothing to resolve the conflict. Both investors come to the same conclusion, that the recent spate of violence, uh, all the violence that occurs mostly as, as a direct result of those indictments against the Hatfields for the McCoy son's murder in 1882, five years after the fact, uh, the subsequent killing, uh, or excuse me, subsequent kidnapping of men in West Virginia by Phillips and his posse um, have incited the violence, have continued the violence. Uh, the results of the joint investigation mark the end of cooperation between West Virginia and Kentucky and opens a new chapter in the feud one that will take one that will take place primarily in the courts rather than in, in Tug Valley, and, and although most of the violence is over regarding this feud by the end of January 1888, the legal maneuvering, uh, the legal drama is just beginning, and we're going to get into that legal drama uh, right after a word from today's final sponsor. Time Suck Today is brought to you by Chicken Joe and Woody's Ghost Brothel. You ever been seduced by a ghost? Ever been sucked by a succubus? Hey, Lucifina! Well, Chicken Joe has combined years of pimping experience with Woody's first-hand knowledge of paranormal penetration to open the world's first boogeyman bordello. Get 25% off demon hand jobs, satanic double penetration, and more when you say, Lucifina, let me in! Anytime this week at the corner of what the shit? And this has gone on too far. 
Ba ba playboy. Ba ba. Everyone needs to pickle tickle. Or the titties touch from town to town. Everyone needs a release. Everyone needs, not everyone has a steady partner, but they worry about picking up something deadly or embarrassing from real life. Uh, tits and bits and pose and hold. But with that flesh move, uh, uh, with the urge the same, we get the same nut from the spirits we tame. You feel you dig and understand where I'm coming from. Hi, everybody. That was Chicken Joe speak for you don't have to worry about STDs when you're not being penetrated by real flesh. I've been rounding up horny ghosts for years, and Chicken Joe knows how to train them into filling the holes you want when you want, or letting you feel their tight air with a swollen member of your underwear. He's even teaching me how to rhyme, so I can pack more entertainment in the same amount of time. Wee! Of course that's not today's final sponsor. That was two, two characters from past episodes who probably just cost me the, the last three listeners that the Air Banjo solos did not get rid of. Time Suck Today is for real brought to you by Eero. Life's too short for bad Wi-Fi. Thankfully, the Eero home Wi-Fi system brings you a fast, reliable connection in every room of the house. Not to mention the second generation Eero and Eero Beacon allow you to build a Wi-Fi system that's more perfectly tailored to your home than ever before. Uh, when you add Eero Plus, you'll get total network protection with the ability to block malicious and unwanted content ar across your entire network by checking the sites uh, you visit against the database of millions of known threats. Eero Plus prevents you from accidentally visiting malicious sites without slowing anything down. Uh, Eero Plus also automatically tags sites that contain violent, uh, illegal, or adult content so you can choose what your kids can and cannot visit right from the Eero app, which is an amazing app. Uh, with a 12-year-old boy at home, Kyler, uh, this is a huge feature for me and Lindsay. Uh, you know, we don't need Lucifina showing Kyler uh, what his mind isn't quite ready to process. We don't need him staring at some images and thinking, how do you even do that? People like that? Uh, like the horrors I just spoke of with uh, Chicken Joe and Woody. Uh, yeah, we, we probably want to have certain things uh, kept from him. I also love how uh, with my Eero system, I can open up my Eero app and see how many devices are, are logged on, taking up bandwidth. The app tells me exactly how much uh, you know uh, each device is using, and I can shut down forgotten devices to make sure that uh, you know everything else is running better. And I also like that it took about five minutes for me, not kidding, to set the Eero system up. And I don't, I don't think I even used a bunch of profanity, which is kind of my norm when uh, setting up technical things. So easy, so fast. So stop worrying about Wi-Fi. Upgrade to Eero. Uh, get a hundred dollars off the Eero base unit and two beacons package, and a year off Eero Plus when you visit eero.com slash timesuck, enter the code timesuck at checkout. That's E-E-R-O dot com slash timesuck, code timesuck at checkout. Whee! Now let's talk about uh, how the preceding years of Hatfield and McCoy violence, but mostly Hatfield violence, let's be honest, uh, pits Kentucky and West Virginia further against each other, takes both states all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, February of 1888, Recognizing that Governor Buckner not going to budge on his desire to see the Hatfield extradited, Governor Wilson decides to begin legal proceedings against the state of Kentucky. Um, first, Wilson sends an agent to Governor Buckner demanding that the release, demanding, excuse me, the release of nine prisoner Hatfields, asserting that their arrest at the hands of Phillips, acting as a state agent, had been illegal. Uh, Buckner refuses the request, so then Wilson uh, files a uh, writ of habeas uh, corpus on behalf of the Hatfield prisoners. On February 9th, 1888, the case is presented to the U.S. District Court in Louisville, Kentucky. The main argument of West Virginia's case was that Phillips and his crew, acting as agents of the state of Kentucky, had acted illegally when they went into West Virginia to arrest the Hatfields. And that since Phillips and his men were acting as agents on behalf of the state of Kentucky, and because the Constitution protects all its citizens against unlawful seizure, the case had become a federal issue. Eustace Gibson, lawyer who represented West Virginia in the Hatfields in these proceedings, also challenges the legitimacy of the warrant since the state of Kentucky had waited five years to pursue the Hatfields and only did so after McCoy attorney Perry Klein essentially bribed the governor to get involved. The state of Kentucky, represented by J. Proctor Knott, a former governor, refutes the argument that this was a federal case on several points and also argues that Wilson couldn't file writs of habeas corpus for the prisoners as a state agent or a third party. The judge ultimately uh, found in favor of West Virginia and ordered that all nine prisoner Hatfields appear in his court on February 20th for a habeas corpus hearing. Uh, the press in Kentucky outraged by this decision. Those in West Virginia feel justice has been done. Uh, the hearing begins on February 25th 
And uh, after debate by both sides, court is recessed until Monday, February 27th. During the hearing, Kentucky argues that a criminal could not try to escape prosecution by claiming illegality or irregularity of his arrest. Officer Phillips had been acting as a private individual rather than a state agent when he arrested the Hatfields and that the state was not responsible for Phillips' men's actions during the course of the arrest. West Virginia argues that the arrest is illegal because the prisoners have been held in custody for 12 hours before the legal execution of their warrants and that Phillips had claimed authority as a state agent at the time of the arrest. So a bunch of legal maneuverings. Uh, March 3rd, the judge delivers his decision. He feels that the case is essentially an argument between the two states and refers the case up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Hog folk versus dog folk. Making its way from the Tug River Valley all the way to the Supreme Court of the U.S. of A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ding, 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 ding. Uh, West Virginia Governor Wilson appeals the decision on March 5th. The judge grants the appeal, which passes to the U.S. Circuit Court on April 5th. Here, Eustace Gibson, the lawyer who represented West Virginia in the Hatfields, again argues that the arrest of the Hatfields in West Virginia constituted unlawful seizure. The state of Kentucky attorney, former Kentucky Governor Jay Proctor, not acknowledges that the arrests were unlawful, but claims that it didn't matter because they were then lawfully arrested in Kentucky, and the judge in the appeals case reaffirms the decision to send the trial to the U.S. Supreme Court. So now... April 13th, 1888, lawyers for both West Virginia and Kentucky arrive in Washington, D.C. to present their arguments for the case. The arguments begin on April 23rd. West Virginia, a.k.a. Uh, the Hatfields, uh, lawyer Gibson, stick to his original point that the whole uh, series of events from capturing West Virginia through arrest and incarceration in Kentucky continuous, uh, con constituted excuse me, a single continuous uh, act by the agents on behalf of the state of Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky's uh, attorney, a.k.a. the McCoy's attorney, not declares that it had never been that had that it had never been excuse me an issue between the two states, but rather between private individuals. And if it had been a state issue, West Virginia should have filed to the U.S. Supreme Court directly instead of going to the fir first to the district court. Jesus Christ! <laughs> the general opinion was that this was correct and that West Virginia had made a procedural error. Ultimately, the Supreme Court rules that while the initial arrest and abduction of the Hatfields in West Virginia was unconstitutional, there were no grounds for charging Kentucky with wrongdoing to the state of West Virginia. So now Kentucky wins the case, and uh, Hatfields are now on the run. So get, get you filthy hard folk. Y'all now get the feds are going to be chasing you, you swine. So now several Hatfields are being searched, uh, looked for, to be put on trial for the New Year's attack on the Randall McCoy's home. In the spring of 1888, West Virginia authorities take legal measures of their own against the men responsible for the arrests, indicting Frank Phillips, that deputy sheriff, uh, or yeah, indicting, excuse me, Frank Phillips, deputy sheriff John Yates of Pike County, and assorted McCoys for the murder of Jim Vance. Additionally, they offer substantial rewards for the rest of Phillips and other men. McCoy men on the run now as well. So a lot of legal maneuvering for really the same results. You still have just Hatfield people being chased by uh, authorities on behalf of Kentucky, and you still have McCoy people now being chased by authorities on behalf of West Virginia. Uh, by the summer of 1888, the rewards offered for the Hatfields in Kentucky and the McCoys in West Virginia had totaled to about $8,000, which draws the attention of various kind of detectives from all over the country, Pinkertons and others descending on the Tug Valley with uh, hopes of getting rich by capturing some of these people and collecting some rewards. Um, on both sides, these, these new outliers, these new uh, you know, uh, detectives are met with disdain, sometimes outright hostility. Most of the wanted Hatfield and McCoy men seek refuge in the mountains, just hide out until things cool down, letting their women and kids at home, uh, you know, let them mine the properties. Devil Lance, he himself moves to a remote, narrow valley near Sturrett, West Virginia. Sorry if I'm saying that name wrong. Uh, it's a small, unincorporated area in Logan County that no one outside of that area gives a single fuck about. Uh, no one has published any type of pronunciation guide. So if you're like, ah, actually, that's pronounced uh, Sturrett, you and seven people care about that. Um, anyway, Devil Ants hides there to protect himself from these new outsiders. Uh, he even set up a kind of fortress for his clan should they need to flee into the woods to defend themselves. He stocks a cabin with water, food, fuel, arms, and ammunition in case of a prolonged siege. <laughs> ah, no big whoops, just, just building a backwoods hillbilly castle to hide out in and shoot at McCoys or any law officers that come to give him any kind of guff. Man, Devil Ants, he truly did earn that nickname. The guy was tough as shit. Not going to go down without a fight. Uh, the feud itself does quiet down as, as guys are not kind of captured. Um, just, you know, despite the ceasefire, the newspapers, they, they try to, you know, keep the feud going by publishing stories. Um, uh, you know, d d delighting the rest of the nation with uh, details, unflattering details of Appalachian life and culture, which I get. You know, that's kind of exactly what I've done in this tale a little bit. 
Uh, occasionally, members of each clan are interviewed. Uh, the Hatfields maintain that they just want nothing but peace. You know, the McCoys maintain they just want some justice. Finally, on August 24th, 1888, eight Hatfields, including Cap, Johnsy, Robert, Elliot Hatfield, Elias Ellison Mounts, French Ellis, Charles Gillespie, Gillespie, Thomas Chambers are indicted for the murder of Alifair McCoy, old Randall's young daughter, during the infamous New Year's Eve attack all those years back on the McCoy homestead. Uh, in the fall of 1888, Charles Gillespie is the first man arrested for the attack, captured in Virginia on September 15th. Ellison Mounts, that illegitimate son of Ellison Hatfield and nephew of Devil Ants, often called Cotton Top Mounts, uh, is arrested before the end of October. Also in the fall of 1889, uh, nine Hatfield prisoners end up going on trial for the 1882 murders of the McCoy sons at the end of August 1889. So those two events, uh, the retribution killings of the three sons and then the attack on the cabin, they just haven't died still. Because, you know, no one on the Hatfield side has been punished. Um, before the trial begins, Ellison Cottontop Mounts confesses to the role, uh, his role in these murders, provides testimony recounting the events of August 9th, 1882. He names Devil Anse, John Z, Cap, Bill, uh, and Tom Hatfield, Alex Mesner, Tom Chambers as the shooters, describes the murder of Jeff McCoy as told to him by Cap. The prosecution presents additional 19 witnesses, including eight more Hatfields. Uh, the jury finds... Wall Hatfield, brother of Devil Ann's, guilty of murder, recommends a sense of life imprisonment. Wall appeals his verdict, and on September 5th, 19, or 1889, his sentence is suspended for 60 days, while several other defendants are tried. Hatfield associate Alex Mezer, uh, Doc Mahon, Wall Hatfield's son-in-law, Pliant Mahon, another son-in-law, tried simultaneously, all found guilty, all given life sentences. Um, none, none of these people will end up serving as long as maybe they were supposed to. Bastard Ellison Mounts, described in historical accounts as being dim-witted. Cottontop Mounts, yeah, basically is uh, intellectually, you know, uh, disabled. Confesses, you know, again, had confessed that role of Alfred McCoy, entered a guilty plea, and he is actually sentenced to death. So sadly, the one person involved in this feud who really just mentally is the least responsible, this intellectually disabled person, is the one sentenced to death. Um, uh, and he's held in uh, Pike County Jail until his execution. The rest of the convicted Hatfields transported to Lexington on September 5th. All appeal their verdicts, but on November 9th, 1889, the Kentucky Court of Appeals upholds these convictions and sentences. Uh, although Mount's execution originally scheduled uh, for December 3rd, it was postponed until February 18th. Uh, authorities in Kentucky fully expect the Hatfields to mount a rescue attempt, but it doesn't happen. In the days leading up to the execution, large crowds began to gather in Pikeville to witness the hanging, despite the fact that a public execution is illegal in Kentucky this time. Uh, for his part, Mount seems resigned to his fate, refusing to talk, eat, or receive uh, word from the local pastor. He smokes a cigar, refuses to speak on the morning of February 18th as his death warrant is read. Before public, before public executions were illegal, officials had surrounded the site with a wooden fence, or excuse me, because they were illegal. However, they placed the fence at the base of a hill uh, so that uh, people just sit on the hill can just look down over the fence. They actually put a scaffold up there so people can view the proceedings. Uh, when asked if he had any final words, Mount said he was ready to die, but at the final moment, he did cry out, they made me do it, the Hatfields made me do it. Uh, and then the public execution of Cottontop does seem to finish the feud. Uh, they've just hung, uh, or hanged, I guess, sorry. They've just hanged an intellectually disabled man. This is a low point. Seems to wake everybody up to the craziness of what all has happened. Doesn't bring anybody back. Uh, West Virginia withdraws the rewards for the capture of the uh, McCoys. Uh, although charges against additional Hatfields do remain outstanding in Kentucky, such as the charge of murder against Devil Ants for that vigilante execution of those three McCoy boys. Little is ever done about it. On February 24th, 1891, word that the feud is over comes from a member of the Hatfield family in the form of a letter to the press. Cap Hatfield, or Cap Hatfield, one of uh, Devil Ann's sons, writes this letter to the, to the Wayne County News saying, I ask your valuable paper for these few lines. A general amnesty has been declared in the famous Hatfield and McCoy feud, and I wish to say something of the old and the new. I do not wish to keep the old feud alive, and I suppose that everybody, like myself, is tired of the names of Hatfield and McCoy and the border warfare in time of peace. The war spirit in me has abated, and I sincerely rejoice at the prospect of peace. I have devoted my life to arms. We have undergone a fearful loss of noble lives and valuable property, valuable property in the struggle. We being like Adam, not the first transgressors, now I propose to rest in a spirit of peace. 
<laughs> That's kind of a funny line it shows in there at the end, though. Uh, we've been like Adam, not the first transgressors. Because they always do that with these apologies in this fear. They're like, ah, what's well, how about it? But just for the record, it was, uh, it was those other people's fault. Uh, regional econo uh, economics may have also had a hand in the end of the feud. By the 1890s, the region of Appalachia, uh, on the brink of an industrial boom, coal and lumber companies are expressing an interest in developing the area. Uh, however, th these companies had been put off by this air of lawlessness in the region. And this provided further incentive for kind of, you know, state officials on both sides to get them to clean up their acts. Let's, you know, let's enough violence to start making some real money. Uh, the new governor of West Virginia, William A. McCorkle, saw industry as a way to prevent further violence, saying, a discord in the mountains was never ending because no new life or no new blood was brought in to dispel it. A railway destroys a feud. Uh, a manufacturer, uh, I don't know what kind of fucking word, a manufactory? I don't know if that's a real word. A manufactory absolutely wipes out neighborhood am animosity and public improvements bring in new conditions. Uh, I guess it is. Manu manu manufactory. Uh, <laughs> does not bring up any spell check uh, red lines. And everybody lived happily ever after. Uh, not quite. Despite the mutual desire of both families and their communities to end the violence, things did not settle down entirely in the valley in the 1890s. The, the Hatfields still had fire in their veins. Check this shit out, man. After all this, they're just, you know, once a Hatfield, always a Hatfield. Uh, in November 1896, Cap Hatfield and his stepson, Joe Glenn, visit the nearby town of Matewan, West Virginia for winter elections. They encounter John Rutherford, a man who Cap shared an old grudge with. Uh, and the two men opened fire as soon as they saw one another. Jesus Christ! Rutherford, his brother-in-law, Henderson Chambers, and Rutherford's nephew, Elliot, are all gunned down. Cap and Glenn are captured, tried for murder in April uh, 1897, and then Cap is found guilty of involuntary manslaughter. And Glenn uh, pleads to the sa same charge. Both receive one-year sentences. They, <laughs> they just shoot down three dudes over a grudge in broad daylight. And, uh... Out, you all right? You get a year's sentence. We don't care for that. Uh, we're civilized now. Uh, and then Cap escapes from jail just three months uh, later. Uh, clearly, the Hatfields still have some pull, and the obviously still corrupt Tug River Valley political and uh, justice systems. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then after escaping, uh, Cap resettles in the area. Somehow, doesn't go back to jail. Right? Just uh, hey, Cap, ain't you supposed to be in jail or something for killing those few men? No, I don't. I don't. I don't recall nothing like that, Chef. Oh, okay, okay. All right. So, <laughs> my, my mistake. Sorry about that, Cap. I must have been thinking about someone else recently killing several men in broad daylight, I guess. <laughs> I'll leave you be. Uh, the following year in 1898, uh, Johnsy is finally arrested, all this time later, for his role in the McCoy brothers' execution in 1882, 16 years later. Uh, and also for the, his participation in the, in the New Year's Day McCoy Homestead Massacre in 1888, 10 years before. He's captured by a posse. Uh, led by a local lawman uh, named Humphrey Doc Ellis. Not Doc, it must, I guess it's a, there's so many of the same names. That's also what's fucking terribly confusing about the trying to figure out this tale. So many people have the same goddamn name. Because there was a guy named Doc Ellis who participated in the New Year's Day McCoy Homestead Massacre. I believe this is a different Doc, Doc Ellis. Uh, so yeah, so, so John Z is convicted for participating in both sets of killings. But then he'll soon be free. Because that's just what happened back then. Also in 1898, another son of Devil Lance, John Z's younger brother, Elias M. Hatfield, commits another murder. Elias, too young to be involved in uh, most of the major feud events or even to remember them. In 1898, he was only 21 years old. Uh, intelligent, he had a head for business like his dad, like his pappy. He was well-liked. Uh, like his daddy, like his pappy had a head for business. He wasn't well-liked uh, like his pappy. Because I don't think Devil Lance, I don't think you'd call him well-liked. Uh, he also had a hair-trigger temper. And when his brother John Z is captured all those years later, he swears vengeance on this Doc Ellis fella. Who may be, I couldn't find anything in the article, but it may be the same guy that did participate in that New Year's Day feud, which makes it all the more ridiculous. And that stuff would happen back then. One guy would be part of a posse, you know, involved in killing somebody else. And then years later, that guy would somehow become a lawman and would like go after uh, capturing and arresting dudes who were part of the same fucking posse he was part of. Uh, on July 4th, 1898, at a local Independence Day celebration, Doc Ellis, speak, speaking, uh, or scheduled to speak publicly during the day's events, that morning he boards a train uh, draped in American flags and Independence Day decorations uh, in the tiny town of uh, Yeager, West Virginia, with the intention of heading towards Wilmington, or Williamson for the festive occasion. Along the trek, the train makes a scheduled whistle stop at Gray Yards, approximately 20 miles east of Williamson, across the river, 
from a place called Skinner's. Uh, the same time the train belching clouds of steam slows to a stop at Gray Yards, Elias just happens to be crossing the river, heads to pick up, heading to pick up mail at the post office. Coleman Hatfield, historian and grandson of Devil Lance Hatfield, later documents the events in his own writing, stating that Doc Ellis, uh, a consummate politician, intends to step off the locomotive and shake hands with passengers who are preparing to bolt. As Doc Ellis steps down to a rough wooden slats between two passenger coaches, he just so happens to come face to face with Elias Hatfield who is already standing on the boardwalk talking to travelers. Hello, Elias, Doc mutters as he tries to sidestep the short-tempered Hatfield. Hello, Doc, Elias replies with a wide grin. He firmly places his hand on Doc's shoulder, stopping him in mid-stride. So, Doc, you think you can come take me across to Kentucky, easy as you did my brother? After a few tense seconds, Elias decides this was not the time or place to get revenge and turns away mumbling, you son of a bitch. And he starts speaking with another traveler and friend, I.J. Peril, when all hell breaks loose. Doc Ellis shouts, I'll show you who's the son of a bitch. As he lunged for the doorway of the passenger car and grabbed his rifle, leveling it at Elias. Seeing what was about to take place, or seeing what was about to take place, Peril threw his arm forward, pushing Elias backwards just as Doc squeezed the trigger and the Winchester exploded in gunfire. Travelers on the boardwalk dove for cover, scattering as gun smoke bellowed. The shot just misses Elias' head and he instinctively pivots while jerking his Colt single action from his belt and returns fire. The shot was deafening as the round hit a metal cuff link on Doc's wrist and the 45 bullet ricocheted upward breaking Doc Ellis' neck. Blood spurted from the entrance wound and Doc fell forward dead. On July 12th, Elias turns himself uh, into the Williamson courthouse and is arrested and then jailed on murder charges relating to the death of Humphrey Doc Ellis. His plead is self-defense. Before Elias' court case can come to the conclusion, to its conclusion, his brother Cap, second son of devil, intercedes, decides he's got to help his baby brother break out of jail and escape a possible life sentence in prison or the hangman's noose. And in the middle of the night on August 18th, while Elias waits in a small cell, Cap slips through the back streets of Williamson on horseback, leads a large buckskin pony up behind him. According to family lore, Cap carried heavy riggings with him, and once he arrived at the jail, he secured one end of a heavy rope cable to his saddle horn, <laughs> tied the other to the iron bars covering the jailhouse window and then just uh, he spurs his horse and the force yanks the iron bars free along with some chunks of masonry uh, around the window casing and then uh, you know Elias you know pushes some more masonry aside shimmies out to the opening and then the two just fucking take off uh, they flee the mountain state that night bounce around various nearby states for about a year and then just come home uh, when Elias eventually returns to the mountain state uh, he's immediately arrested and, and later convicted for the murder of Doc Elias. He's sent to the West Virginia Penitentiary at Moundsville, but is quickly paroled by George W. Atkinson, governor of, the, governor of the state and a man with ties to the Hatfields and the Tug Rebellion, of course. John Z. also gets off easy. Uh, Lieutenant Governor of Kentucky William Pryor Thorne requests his request for a pardon shortly thereafter. The Hatfields still have a little bit of pulling in, uh, in Kentucky as well. Uh, Cap ends up becoming a lawyer shortly after that, setting up a practice in Logan County which he then would pass on to his son Coleman and his daughter Eileen. And Eileen, and Eileen excuse me, a little random trivia, would become the first female attorney in Logan County. Uh, I wonder if he used that jailbreak story to win over any clients. When you hire Cap Hatfield, you either get off or you get broke out. It's the Hatfield way. Uh, in the first few decades of the 20th century, the Hatfield and McCoys largely steer clear of trouble. Uh, they steer clear from uh, labor rights that would trouble Mingo and Logan counties from 1991 to 1921. With the exception of one big part of family lore, uh, when uh, Mate Juan Chief of Police Sidney Two Gun Sid Hatfield, that's his nickname, so he's still got some fire. Uh, he's actually an adopted Hatfield, but Hatfield nonetheless, he's at the center of the Mate Juan Massacre, a violent confrontation between miners and guards of the Baldwin Feltz Cold Mines in which nine men are killed. Hatfield and 20 others are tried for murder, who knows exactly how many Hatfield himself shot, uh, before eventually being found not guilty and released, which doesn't set well with certain people. Uh, later on trial for conspiracy charges in 1921, two gun Sid Hatfield gunned down himself, uh, killed on the McDowell County West Virginia courthouse steps. Uh, a retribution killing. Most of the other Hatfields and McCoys uh, did well in the changing landscape of the Tug Rally, uh, taking on professional careers. In fact, in 1913, Henry Drury Hatfield, nephew of Devil Ann's, elected governor of West Virginia passing significant social legislation, working to settle many of the labor disputes plaguing the, uh, the region. At the time of his election, 73-year-old Devil Ann's is still alive and well, so he gets to see this kin of his 
elected governor after living through all the fucking crazy feuding. Uh, Devil Lands at this time is a prosperous farmer with money invested in the local coal and timber trades. Randall McCoy, still alive in 1913, not doing as well as Devil Lands. Uh, no McCoys are really kicking ass in state politics or crushing it in local coal or, or timber either. To make ends meet, the now 87-year-old Randall McCoy, still working, uh, still making money, but working as a ferry operator in Pikeville. He dies on March 28, 1914, succumbing to burn injuries he received after falling into his own fire. Fell into a fire he'd made, uh, cooking at his homestead. Uh, Jesus, man, after all that, he doesn't even get to die a peaceful death. Burned up in his own fire. Probably trying to, to, to cook himself some shitty meal after a long day of work in the ferry. The guy was cursed. His wife, Sarah, had died 24 years earlier, uh, rumored to have died in a mental hospital. Never fully recovered from that pistol whooping Jonesy put on her. Uh, Devil Anns died of pneumonia seven years later on January 6, 1921. His funeral was the largest ever held in Logan County. His death attracted national media attention. Uh, supposedly, his last words were, I won! I fucking won! Woo! Hawkfield always come out on top of dog folk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck Randall McCoy. He didn't fall no fire. I pushed him into the flames I made with my own mind. I'm the devil. I'm the goddamn devil and the devil don't die. And I will haunt the McCoys forever. That's probably not true. But it definitely takes us out of today's time suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. That was exhausting. That was an exhausting suck. Uh, I hope I got all the uh, the names and places right. I, I rewrote this and edited this uh, document to work off of so many times uh, this past week. So many relations. So many people to keep track of in this story. But essentially, I mean, you know, you, you, you get the gist. It's just two families not letting shit die for so long. Uh, today's suck, it really did make me truly, truly think about uh, the consequences of just not letting shit slide. Like, I've written a lot of stand-up over the years. A lot of stand-up comedy, essentially about vengeance. Essentially about <laughs> violent thoughts. What I'd like to do to somebody, you know, to teach them a lesson for some minor infraction or uh, perceived insults. And today, reflect on this feud, I, I just think about how maybe that's not always the best way to live. You know, like, uh, I thought about this, this moment I shared on a plane with a stranger a couple years ago. Uh, it's long been a pet peeve of mine about how when people are getting off a plane... They don't under, like some people don't seem to give a shit about just etiquette. Etiquette breaches in general obviously fire me up. Uh, but, but this one in particular is when, you know, if, if, if you travel and you don't know this, it's very simple. You let the people out in the row in front of you before you get out. What you don't do is just push your way down the aisle past people trying to get out of their seat. It's just fucking rude. I don't know how people do not understand that. And, it, and it's driven me crazy over the years. And sometimes I will just openly be like, all right, man, that's cool. Just fucking do what you want to do. Don't worry about anybody else in the plane. Like in a grouchy moment, I'll just openly say shit. <laughs> Once I threw my arm out into the aisle, I was like, no, that's not how this works. You wait for the people in front of you. And, you know, maybe that's not, maybe that's not the best way to do things. And then I, I was bitching about this one time, uh, openly bitching about somebody who just pushed past me and some other people. I, I was sitting in first class. I, I fly so much, I get upgrades sometimes. Kind of, kind of sweet. If you fly a, a crazy amount every once in a while, yeah, you get these up, upgrades for free. And uh, this guy was probably somebody who, who paid for his first class. He was dressed as someone who's probably had a lot of money, in my mind at least, seemed very successful, calm and poised. And I asked him if he ever just kind of snapped on these people. And, uh, and he just kind of looked at me like I was insane. And he goes, no, it's not worth it. I've got too much to lose. And then just, you know, didn't talk to me anymore. And I, and I felt like an idiot. Uh, and I just thought, you know, what the fuck am I doing? You know, maybe maybe saying something isn't that big of a deal, but, but maybe I shouldn't throw my arm out in the aisle. You know, because then I was thinking like, I thought about what he meant, you know, like what you can lose from just overreacting. Like, what if I throw my arm out and then that causes somebody to push past my arm and then I push them, like it escalates into something physical. And then while it's being sorted out legally, what if I get banned from flying? That does, that can happen. That would seriously fuck my career up. What if I, you know, I can't exactly drive from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho to, uh, you know, Buffalo, New York. Uh, in, in time to also have my family here and run this podcast and, and make it to my next game. It's just not feasible to drive the way my kind of uh, tour routing goes. You know, um, or, or what if it took, got took it even further? What if uh, a fight breaks out? You know, what if I intentionally actually, uh, uh, or unintentionally, intentionally end up hurting somebody on a flight? It becomes this federal thing. What if I go to fucking prison? 
you know, lose my career, lose a lot of money, all because I just couldn't let some shit slide. How stupid, you know? Uh, you know, it's tough, man. On the one hand, you don't want to let just the world walk all over you, you know, just be a doormat for everybody. But on the other, you know, you, you got to think about a situation. You don't want to overreact and throw your life away needlessly to escalate a situation to a very scary place. A lot of lessons to be learned from this Hatfield McCoy feud. You know, when do you just cut your losses? When do you just walk away? What if Randall McCoy hadn't went to the authorities after his three sons were killed by that Hatfield posse? I mean, the only reason that posse went after them is because... You know, during some stupid fight at an election, his sons had stabbed the shit and then shot Devil Ann's brother in cold blood. They weren't innocent, but Randall couldn't let it go. He wanted what he thought was justice, and it just kept escalating. You know, he ended up getting his fucking house burned down, ended up getting his wife pistol whipped into a, a mental institution. You know, what's that saying? You know, cooler heads prevail. I think there is some truth to that. Uh, it's a lesson I need to remind myself often. Uh, or is the lesson that when you're facing a, a ruthless appoint, opponent like Devil Ants, do you need to be more ruthless to end things? Like, what if rather than going to the authorities, uh, what if Randall McCoy would have stormed Devil, Devil Ants' house with his own posse and burned that to the ground? Or would that have just escalated the same way? Probably. Is the lesson to know your limits? You know, should, should Randall McCoy, should he have learned that Devil Ants was just a superior opponent? That's what it seemed like to me, digging in this story. I'm not trying to piss off the many uh, McCoy kin, some of whom I'm sure probably listen to this podcast, but, you know, maybe Devil Lands was just out of Randall's league. He had more men, more guns, more ruthless. Maybe Randall should have recognized he was outmanned. He was outmeaned. I don't know. I think the lesson you can take away at the very least is to think about your actions. Think about the consequences of your actions. What reactions could they cause? What chain of events could they kick off? Are the consequences of those pot potential reactions worth the actions you're choosing to take? Think before you act. Always, uh, always probably a good thing to do. Uh, yeah. I mean, or maybe, maybe there's some important lesson I'm just missing. Let's find out by checking in with today's Idiots of the Internet. Idiots of the Internet. 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 User Fast the Latest News published a video called Hatfields and McCoys, What Really Happened? On July 12, 2013, uh, 213,770 views and 175 comments. The description reads... The 19th century rivalry between two West Virginia clans has become the most famous family feud in American history. Correspondent Rita Braver spoke with descendants from both sides to help navigate the historic battles, countless myths, and tall tales to find the truth. Yeah, because there is so many rumors on the, online about this stuff. Uh, Dr. Madcap Rx writes, I have a feeling in today's world the McCoy family would all be hooked on meth. <laughs> uh, yeah, just crack me up. Yeah, uh, po probably. Uh, possible at the very least. I think, actually, uh, meth abuse would have been kinder to the McCoy family than Devil Ann's was. Um, more of an observation than a lesson, you know, drawn from this tale, but, but an interesting one. User Joshua Witt posts a great Captain Obvious comment, typing, I, I fucking love when people do this, he types, the Hatfields lived in West Virginia and the McCoys lived in Kentucky. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank, thank you, Josh. Uh, thank you for writing that uh, in the comment section. Thank you writing for what the narrator just continuously says in the video. Why do people do that? Uh, I feel like that's like watching a trailer for Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation, and then commenting, Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise is in this movie. Or even better, this movie is called Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation. Uh, or better still, uh, under this YouTube trailer for Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation, just commenting, I just watched the trailer for Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation. It's on YouTube. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, user lost 94133 types, Good bless the Confederation. May it rise again. And I just thought this was uh, especially idiotic. Of course, someone wanting to see the uh, Confederate States rise again is someone fucking terrible at spelling. Uh, God only has one O, dipshit. Uh, user Barry Barnes wants us all to know he enjoyed this video, writing, Thought the video was good. <laughs> uh, that's nice, Barry. Uh, glad you decided to write that lukewarm compliment. Uh, I like how you also made it clear that the video might not be good. You know, you just think it is. You know, I just, I thought, thought the video was good. You're not throwing out hard facts. You're not trying to push people too hard. It's just your opinion, nothing more. You seem sweet, Barry. Uh, probably not a riveting conversationalist, but sweet. Uh, user Remy JB posts, related or not, you are not them. You are what you are. A lot of exclamation points in this uh, post. And I have a feeling that Remy JB would, would think she was a lot smarter than Barry Barnes if she met him, but uh, I think she'd be wrong. She seems like one of those uh, 
uh, pseudo philosophers, you know, thinking they're throwing out, you know, profound shit, but it's just like a fucking series of like, okay, I guess, I guess you needed to write that. Uh, and then Barry Barnt is back, back in the comments. Uh, a few comments down the thread typing, very love the history of this family. Oh, Barry. I hope you have a lot of nice people in your life that, that love you in spite of the dumb shit you must constantly say. What do you think of dinner, Bear? I thought this meal was good, Sheila. I very love your tuna casserole. Uh, user Riley has me second-guessing how ancestry works, posting, My great-grandmother was a direct descendant of the Hatfields. Doesn't that mean if your great-grandmother is a direct descendant of a family, well, then aren't you a fucking direct descendant? This, this is really, like, I've thought way too much about this. I had to look up the meaning of direct descendant after reading Riley's comics. I was like, wait a minute, is this stupid or is, this, or is he right? Uh, here's the me definition. A direct descendant is someone who can trace their lineage by child relationships all the way back to a desired ancestor. A non-direct descendant has to go through a cousin or by marriage or some other non-child relationship in order to find the desired ancestor. So I would think... The way, I, the way I'm looking at it, unless you're adopted, you are the direct descendant of your grandma, right? I mean, your grandma gave birth to either your father or mother, and then your father or mother married someone and produced, or what, whatever, had a relationship with somebody and produced you, so you would be the direct descendant of anyone that your grandparent is the direct descendant of. I don't know. Damn it, I still feel confused. Whatever Riley has may be contagious. I'm sorry if I just infected you now as well. Uh, Brooklyn McCoy wrote, and this just, I was tired when I read this. It really fucking irritated me. Uh, she wrote, this made me cry, but I forgive them. Fucking stop it, Brooklyn. Stop. You cried? You cried. Like literally cried. And felt the need to, to publicly forgive them. What, for how you've been wronged? Well, because ancestors of yours died with your last name McCoy? I'm guessing what? Over a hundred years before you were born. You forgive people who killed them who also died in all likelihood, over a hundred years before you were born. The feud was over in 1890, 128 years ago. I just, it's always annoyed me when people try to glom onto tragedy that I don't feel they have any ownership in, right? Like, uh, like after 9-11, terrible tragedy, but there was people who I feel like went way out of their way to get attention for themselves when they weren't re related to anybody who died. Uh, they weren't related to anybody who was related to somebody who died. They didn't know anybody who died. They didn't know anybody who knew somebody that died. And it just felt like this, like, like look at me. Look how sad I am. Look at how uh, much of a caring person I am. Uh, yeah, I, I could just never be close friends with somebody that melodramatic. What's, what's going on, Brooklyn? Why are, why are you crying? Why are you upset? I'm so upset. <laughs> I, I, just, I, read a, I just read about the Black Plague. And I studied my family tree, and some of my grandparents died horrible deaths, and I was crying in my eyes out all day. Wait, your, your grandparents died in the Black Plague? Yes, my great, 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 like 50 more great grandparents. Yeah, I'm going to grab my shit now and fucking leave and never talk to you again. Uh, have a nice life, drama queen. 80% uh, of the posts on this uh, thread are of someone letting the rest of the commenters know that they are either related to the Hatfields or the McCoys. Just a lot of comments of, I'm a Hatfield, I'm a McCoy. Uh, which is why I think Chris Official wins the section of, uh, today, of the internet today <laughs> when they post simply, I'm not related. Well played, Chris. If you see it in the, in the thread, it's so great. It's like 20 comments of just like, I'm related to this, I'm related. And finally someone's like, uh, I'm not related. Uh, I don't think I'm related either. And that's enough for today's Idiots of the Internet. Idiots of the Internet. 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 Okay, so it turns out I didn't learn much in today's Idiots of the Internet examination. Maybe we should have had Paisley back in here today. Maybe he could have uh, added his insight. Uh, I did learn that, uh, you know, I, I, I do really think it's ridiculous when you, when you weep over shit that happened to people who you never knew who died long ago. Uh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong that way. Maybe I'm just a cold-blooded monster. It's possible. Uh, I have been accused many times over the course of my life of not being, uh, empathetic enough to, <laughs> to people in certain situations. I did joke a long time ago about how, uh, I could never be a counselor, you know, uh, which was supposed to be my path just because I'm not, uh, I can't entertain people's, uh, you know, whining like some people can. It, it comes across. Some people complain of their problems, comes across to me like, shut the fuck up. Suck it up! 
But hopefully you got a few chuckles. And, and since I can't think of any additional lessons, let's uh, look back again on the ones we did learn today, have some fun with some silly new info in today's Top 5 Takeaways. Time suck. Top 5 Takeaways. Number one, the two instigators of this feud were Devil Ann's Hatfield and Randall McCoy, patriarchs of the Hatfield and McCoy families. And ironically, both would outlast the famous feud they started. Uh, number two, Randall McCoy lived a long life of misery. He lived to the age of 88, saw five kids die in the feud, saw his wife beat nearly to death. Devil Ants, uh, Hatfield to me is undeniably the winner of this feud. Yes, his nephew uh, would get hanged and his brother murdered, and other relatives would be sent to prison, but none of his sons would die in the feud. 11 of his 13 kids would outlive him, uh, even though he lived to be 81. 10 years before he died, two of his kids, 33-year-old uh, Elias and 31-year-old Troy, would die in a gunfight, of course, uh, in Montgomery, West Virginia in 1911, uh, killing the man shooting both of them uh, over a disagreement about whom got, uh, over who got to sell liquor to whom in Montgomery. The Hatfield brothers uh, allegedly started the fight, fire, still fire, uh, running those Hatfield uh, hog folk veins. Uh, number three, the feud began uh, in earnest over accusations of hog theft in 1878 and ended with the hanging of an intellectually disabled man in 1890 and in between hog theft and what seems uh, uh, like a, a very ill-advised hanging, a, a lot of other people died. Uh, number four, number four is Ding 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 you know, we got, got to have the pig as well. The McCoy family won the week-long series three games to two, while the Hatfields won more money, $11,272 to the McCoys, $8,459. The decision was made to augment the McCoy uh, family winnings to $11,273, $1 more since they had won the most games. And if Devil Ants was still alive, he, he, he would have been slighted enough by this incident to, uh, to kill at least two more McCoys. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Hatfields and McCoys have been sucked. I hope I did it justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, man, Devil Ants, not a man to be trifled with. Oh shit, man. Uh, and, and Randall McCoy, not a guy who could let shit slide. Uh, but yeah, Devil Ants, man, he seemed, he seemed uh, as scary as some of the serial killers uh, that we've sucked on this show. Uh, thank you again to the entire, entire Time Suck team, the, the high priestess of the Suck, Harmony Velikamp, Jesse Guardian of Grammar Dobner, uh, out sick this week. Hope you're feeling better, uh, Jesse. Uh, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, Time Suck High Priest Alec Dugan, the guys at Bit Elixir, Danger Brain, Space Lizards, Merch Wizards, Access Apparel, Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins. Uh, and speaking of Access, uh, yeah, we, again, we got that 25% off sale in the store starting Cyber Monday leading to the following Sunday. Hope you take advantage of that. Huge thanks to First Time Suck researcher Devin Stewart for kicking some ass. Devin, I hope I did justice to your research. Uh, we'll be getting more help from Devin on at least one more suck going forward. Hopefully more after that, man. You crushed it. Uh, in an email with Lindsay, Devin wrote, I thought this was fun, fun to share. I talked to my Hatfield friend about any good family stories. And while he didn't have any, he did share what I think is a pretty interesting piece of information. Apparently, his Hatfield ancestors were only distant relations to the Appalachian Hatfields and didn't even live in the region at the time the feud occurred. Despite this, his grandmother, who is only that kind of Hatfield by marriage, still takes the relation very seriously and still insists that the Hatfields were in the right in the dispute. I found that really funny <laughs> and really telling given the ferocity of clan loyalties and how they propelled the feud. Yeah, man. Uh, the feud continues in some people's minds, I guess, in at least an argumentative form. Just hog folks still not taking guff from dog folk. Uh, thanks to everyone who, for, uh, for enjoying the Time Suck Private uh, Cult of the Curious Facebook group and, uh, and those finding the, uh, the, the Discord group, uh, obviously on Discord. Uh, link to both places in today's episode description. Get in there and mingle with some like minded meat sacks. Don't start no feuds. Uh, Time Suck is like a fun school. Uh, then those are the places that are like a fun recess. Hail Nimrod! Uh, next up. Uh, Topic-wise, the Space Lizard selected Pinkerton Detective Agency. 19th century American history continues. Might be some more banjo. I don't know. Might not. Might not. Might be. 
Uh, Pinkerton's America's first detectives chase down a fair amount of Wild West outlaws. Law dogs. Uh, the Pinkertons actually inspired the term private eye. Uh, the Pinkerton Agency first made its name in the late 1850s for hunting down outlaws, providing private security for the new railroad business. As the company's profile grew, its iconic logo, a large unblinking eye, accompanied by the slogan, We Never Sleep, gave rise to the term private eye, a nickname for detectives. Uh, 1856, a little more trivia, 23-year-old uh, widow, Kate Warren, walked into Pinkerton's Chicago's office, requested a job as detective. Founder Alan Pinkerton was hesitant to hire a female investigator, but gave in after Warren convinced him that she could, quote, worm out secrets in many places to which it was impossible for male detectives to gain access. True to her word, Warren proved to be an expert at working undercover, once busting a thief by cozying up to his wife and convincing her to re reveal the location of the loot. Uh, during another case, she got a suspect to feed her crucial information by disguising herself as a fortune teller. That's awesome. Uh, Pinkerton would later list Warren as one of the best investigators he had ever hired. Following her death in 1868, he even had her buried in his family plot. So you want a little more than just trivia? You want some jokes? Want some story? Listen next week or watch on YouTube. Time now for Time Sucker Updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker Updates. All right, a lot of good ones today. Uh, first update. Some new World War I info from World War I obsessed Time Sucker Sam Little. Uh, who writes, Dear Master Sucker and Knight Errant of Nimrod. My name is Sam. I've been a fan of your comedy long before Time Suck, and like many others, I was thrilled when you started it and have loved it since. Thank you very much. Uh, I listen to my job as a letter carrier for USPS, and I'm pretty sure that people think I'm insane on account of me bursting out laughing every 10 minutes or so. Hail Nimrod. Uh, now, I just want to say I've been, I've been waiting for the World War I suck for a long time, and you absolutely crushed it. Oh, that's nice. I, I, I definitely gave it my all. I'm um, sure I missed a lot of stuff, but uh, it's such an interesting and important part of history that often gets overlooked, and you really did it justice. I hope you and the rest of the Time Suck community learned a lot from it. If I may, I just wanted to share some other interesting details as to why the U.S. finally entered the war, and I did not know this stuff, Sam, so thank you for sharing this. Many people think that it was the sinking of the Litswana, or Le I don't have, uh, I didn't put phonetic there. I, th I think I kind of got that right. That big ship uh, that finally dro drove us to it, but as you know, that happened in May 1915 and it would be almost another two years before the U.S. declared war in Germany. It is also important to note that the U.S. was sending weapons and munitions to Britain via civilian ships. Germany knew this and did warn the U.S. to cease sending supplies. To ease tensions, Germany began to restrict the amount of U-boat use, but the war dragged on. They were preparing to restore unrestricted submarine warfare, which all but confirmed a U.S. intervention, and it was the Zimmerman telegram that really drove the nail in it. I'm sure you came across this while proposing your research. A German foreign, I actually didn't, not the, not the specific Zimmerman, Zimmerman telegraph. A German foreign minister, Arthur Zimmerman, attempted to strike a deal with Mexico, vowing to reestablish the territories lost to them in the Mexican-American War. The message was intercepted by English code breakers and shared with their allies. Mexico also rejected the terms. Uh, on May 1st, 1917, it was released to the American public, and one month later, the U.S. declares war. Uh, here comes cheeseburgers and freedom, you jerry bastards. Uh, fascinating stuff, and like with most pivotal moments in history, you got to ask yourself the what ifs. What if the U.S. decided to remain neutral until the end? What would Russia look like today if Lenin and the Bolsheviks did not get the support needed to take control of the provisional democratic government? Would there be more or less uh, suburban Mexican family restaurants if Mexico did declare war? Who knows? Uh, thank you so much for listening, and thanks again for this great podcast. Doing my best to spread the suck at work to my friends and family. Was bummed to have missed your show in Providence. Uh, but I hope Yamo be back. Yamo be back to Rhode Island. Yamo be back. Uh, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Uh, yeah, I didn't know about the telegram. Uh, I knew the gist about the submarine stuff, and, it, uh, and I knew that the government, the U.S. government obviously was getting, obviously getting pissed that German U-boats were, were sinking some of their, uh, you know, people's supply ships, some of their merchants' supply ships going out there. Um, now a scary ghost story update coming in from Phil Foster. I love these. This is from that, you know, uh, Ed Lorraine demonologist suck. Hello, Master Sucker, Space Lizard Phil in the real world. Beef steak on Discord. <laughs> uh, and I have a short ghost story for you that all these other ones managed to drag. Uh, I have a short ghost story for you that all these other ones managed to drag out of place in my mind where I hide scary shit. Uh, when I was around 12 and my sister was 10, she kept telling us that she would see multiple... All black shadow people in her room at night. Yeah, you know I uh, get freaked out by shadow people. Uh, she would say that they would not notice her at all, but seemed like it was some kind of social party. Then one time, she told me about something that is currently making my skin crawl. 
Uh, one night, she saw one of them bend down to one of the family cats, the shadow person, and reached out to pet it, and the cat reacted. The shadow person stroked the cat, and if you've ever petted a cat from head to tail, they always have their butts raise up, and she said that happened. I have no reason to, to doubt it, but, but man, uh, freaky thinking shadow people might have been petting our pets. Also, you'd better invite Joe motherfucking Paisley in on the edits of the internet until your podcast together starts, or I will softly cry in a corner, and you will have to live without having making uh, a fellow bearded man cry. Or you have to live with having made a fellow bearded man cry. Uh, suck on, suck, Master Phil Foster. Thank you, Phil. Oh, man, you're probably crying today. You're probably crying now hearing this. Yeah, man, we'll, uh, we'll, have, we'll have Paisley pop back in for the, to the internet until we can get our podcast up. Uh, hilarious email from Cade Rittenhouse. Cade wrote, Dear Great Time Sucker, my name is Cade Rittenhouse. I'm a 19-year-old college student trying to become an electrician. Oh, man, good for you. I have to tell you, I was listening to your Woody bit. Whee! Uh, with my headphones in during my business break room. Or, or with my headphones in in my business break room while I was listening to my boss. Uh, the corporate bro- boss was in the break room having a meeting w- with uh, my boss and some of the higher ups when another employee friend of mine comes in and ripped the headphones out of my phone. Normally the podcast would pause, but this time it did not. So Woody, your Woody bit played out loud in front of my boss and the higher ups. Uh, my boss looked at me with anger and I was terrified that I was going to get fired when one of the higher ups looked at me like I was crazy and then one of them said, what's his big deal? Ha! Uh, I was shocked. I clocked into work. I was so shocked I clocked into work and quickly got to my post. Uh, I was working there for 20 minutes and then my boss called me into his office. I was scared I was going to lose my job. Uh, and then I went into his office and my boss was smiling. He said the man who laughed was a local merchant of sorts that they've been trying to get a deal with and that playing your podcast got to help get us the deal. My boss was so happy. He gave me a raise, asked me what the podcast was. I said time suck. And a week later, my boss and I are talking about Chikatilo. F- are you fucking serious? I hope, I, I mean, you don't, you don't say you're kidding in this uh, message. I want this to be true so badly. And I'm, I'm assuming it is. Uh, you say, so thank you, Master Time Sucker, Cade Rittenhouse. That is fucking amazing. Ah, I love it. I love how this is spreading. <laughs> I, I, and I have heard that, you know, long, uh, other messages from people, we've got messages from people of like, you know, some kid in a classroom uh, or some teacher, you know, maybe saying that he's uh, or sharing something from Time Suck in a classroom, like in a high school classroom. And then one of the, and some of the high school kids saying stuff like, uh, we all needed that or Hail Nimrod and that kind of shit. It's fucking crazy. Now another World War One update. Uh, sweet, some sweet Marine info coming in hot from Time Sucker John House. Dearest, suckiest of all suckers, thanks for being awesome. I've been a fan of yours since Crazy with the capital F. I've long wanted to see you and was surely sad the Massachusetts show had to be canceled. Yes, sorry about that as well. Uh, but I, we do have, I'm 99% sure, a Boston date on the books. I, I think I just asked Lindsay about that the other day. And I'm, I, yes, I, I'm 99.9% positive I'm going back to Boston uh, in the first half of the year and for a couple nights instead of just one. And then you wrote peer pressure intended. Yeah, okay. I just listened to your World War One suck and I had a few things I thought you'd find interesting. I apologize for the last two paragraphs. You know, a bit preach. Oh yeah, and I did like uh, cut those out just because it was a little bit longer. There's more info. Um, and yeah, the, 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 the two paragraphs were just uh, referencing where to get information. And John did sh- uh, share some really good things. Um, yes. Uh, and then maybe the, the One American News is, is, is maybe they don't always share the most unbiased information. So, yeah, it's, that is such a thing with, man, trying to find info. Uh, you know, you, you find what you think is unbiased. It might be unbiased. Someone else will think it's biased still. It's just it's so hard. But John did share at the end of this, and I didn't, uh, I'm not going to read it now, but he did share, like, the AP has their own app. So rather than get, like, AP articles through other newspapers, you can go directly to the source. I mean, they are, what, America's biggest media institution. I do think, at the very least, most of the time, they really get things right. And I, and I have enjoyed that. So thank you uh, for adding that to my research repertoire. Okay, anyway. The Battle of Belu Wood is a noted battle in Marine Corps history. Some consider it the battle that brought initial acclaim to the Marines and developed the, the mythos surrounding them that we know of today. During that offensive, we lost more Marines in that battle than in all our wars before combined. Still, the Marines pushed through and captured ground via hand-to-hand combat and incredible sharpshooting. During that offensive, two noted things happened. First, Dan Daly, two-time Medal of Honor recipient and outstanding suck candidate, was in charge of a unit that was pinned down by intense fire. Rather than retreat or stay put, he famously yelled, Come on, you son of a bitches! Or no, come on, you sons of bitches! Do you want to live forever? Uh, badass, man. Second, a story emerged from the Battle of Belleau Wood that said the Marines were so fearsome with their sharpshooting that the Germans nicknamed them 
Uh, Devil's Dogs. Oh, yeah, I do remember coming across that in another suck, I think. While some claim this name was actually American propaganda, uh, I prefer to think that the uh, as, as the Marines of World War I commenced badassery, the spirit of the original Devil Dog, Bojangles, imbued them with righteous power. Praise Bojangles! Yeah, maybe he was back there. Uh, the day before Veterans Day is November 10th, also known as the Marine Corps birthday. I did know that, but yeah, thanks for uh, reminding me to share that. The most famous of Marine generals during World War I was General John A. Lejeune, who right after World War I decreed that the Marines would forever celebrate their birthday on November 10th with a birthday message and cake. Uh, the celebration is carried out today regardless of presence in combat. I won't bore you with the whole details of the ceremony, but know that 10, November 10th is a glorious day and it's got some ties to World War I. Uh, another famous Marine in World War I was Smedley Butler, a.k.a. the would-be King of America, he was a major general who received two Medal of Honors during his career for general badassery and is talked of in the same conversational tone as Chesty Puller. He also wrote the book and coined the phrase, War is a Racket. Anyway, during the Great Depression in the U.S., uh, during the Great Depression, excuse me, U.S. veterans of World War I wanted advanced payment of bonds. They were promised to them. The bonds, however, couldn't be paid until the 1940s due to economics mumbo jumbo. That, of course, didn't matter to disabled vet vets struggling with PTSD and poverty, and this led to the creation of the Bonus Army that marched on Washington to demand payment. When the Bonus Army formed, it was a potentially powerful fighting force. Uh, if someone wanted to use it that way, as uh, these were all hardened fighters, uh, war veterans. Years later, a bunch of industrials actually uh, decided that they wanted to perform a military coup on the American government to install a fascist government and recruited Smedley Butler to manipulate and lead what was likely the bonus army to overthrow the government. Butler told them that they could go fuck themselves, reported everything to Congress. Congress did not investigate much uh, given that the industrialists were some of the most powerful men in America, but this is now known as the business plot. And uh, it was a time that we were dangerously close to a very bad situation. I, I may have some details wrong, but this would be a great suck because it's actual conspiracy that actually happened. Love the podcast here. Semper Fi, Bojangles, John House. Thank you, John. And yeah, I didn't share anything, but I got a lot of details out there to people, and uh, I appreciate you writing in. And uh, yeah, and, and, and finding good media is important, because not all, not all news is fake news, meets X. Still a lot of in investigative journalist truth seekers out there. Uh, you know, you don't want to go to a place where you just can't trust anybody. Wrestling update from Heath Major. Uh, <laughs> a New World Order wrestling update. Uh, who says, uh, he says, Oh, you ham and egger jabroni motherfucker. Uh, kidding, sucked him as prime. I hate to correct you, but I feel I must. In the New World Order suck, you stated that the wrestling NWO was a faction in World Class Wrestling, a.k.a. World Wrestling Federation, when in actual fact, they were part of World Championship Wrestling, which was purchased by the World Federal... Wait, by, purchased by the World Wrestling Federation owner Vince McMahon. Uh, definitely a fucking Space Lizard Illuminati wacko in 2000. World Class Championship Wrestling was a completely different wrestling company. Uh, the former pro wrestler and me wanted you to know. Yeah, you know, I think, I feel like I just misspoke in that. The way it was kind of written in a lot of articles was it was tied to the WWF and the WCW. But I probably did portray it as they were like a, the same entity. But yes, yes, they were not. Thank you. And, and then you, uh, Heath writes, uh, thank you for allowing us to smell what the suck is cooking each and every week. And I'll see your candy ass next time you're in Portland, Oregon for a no row barbed wire, bed of nails, barbed wire board, raining thumbtack, time bomb death match. Oh God, please don't. Uh, but thank you for sending that in. Uh, now another World War One update from Canadian, uh, or some Canadian veteran love, excuse me, coming in from a Canadian sucker, Melissa Keene. Melissa writes, Hi, Master Sucker. I just finished the World War I episode as a Canuck from the true north, strong and free. Uh, I couldn't help but notice the distinct lack of Canadians mentioned. The victory at Vimy Ridge was only one example of the epic badassery that was Canada and the Great War. The Canadian war effort was ultimately what led to Canada being recognized as a state, and the signing of the armistice was the first time that Canada signed a treaty on its own behalf. I did not know that. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, the storm trooping you mentioned is what gained uh, Canadians the nickname of storm troopers because even though uh, even through piss soaked rags we were badass. I love worshiping at the feet of Nimrod. Hail Nimrod! While cleaning my igloo <laughs> while cleaning my igloo and taking my dog sled into town. Much love, eh? Melissa Kate. Ah, thank you, Melissa. I love Canadians, man. Uh, yeah, I gotta get back up to Canada again. I gotta figure some shit out with the Canadian government and I gotta get back up there. Uh, now a shout out request from Connor Forbes it says, Hey there, Suckmaster. November the 8th was my girlfriend's birthday. It was also the day the campfire started in Northern California. She and her family lost everything. Jesus. Uh, like so many others in the communities of Paradise and Megalia, 
Uh, suffice to say, she had a pretty shitty birthday. Yeah, I bet. And I thought maybe reaching out to you and asking uh, to have her shouted out on the suck would be a cool way to make up for it. We're both faithful suckers and space lizards. Met you at Sacramento back in May. Her name is Madison, and she would be she would absolutely melt if you mentioned her. I realize it's probably a long shot, but why the hell not? Sincerely faithful space lizard, Connor Forbes. Connor, thank you for writing in, man. And yes, Madison, uh, happy late birthday. Sorry that you had such a terrible, terrible, terrible uh, last month. And hope things are getting better. Hope insurance is fixing some stuff. Hope you're in a good spot now. And hope you're safe. And then last message, <laughs> uh, another shout out. Oh, actually, uh, yeah, yeah, this is the last message. Sorry, man. Uh, last minute, another shout out coming in from Ken. Uh, hey, Dan, quick note from Grand Rapids, Michigan. I was able to catch your show at Dr. Grin's this last weekend, Friday, 8 p.m. My wife and I were supposed to be there with friends of ours, but the wife of my friend wasn't feeling well, so uh, she was at the hospital getting tested. My friend was at the show, but then had to leave before you took stage because he found out his wife needed to have her gallbladder removed immediately. Everything went well with her surgery and, and she is on the mend. I love the dedication, by the way, that she went to the hospital for possible surgery. She's like, yeah, yeah, baby, I'm gonna see you after the fucking show. We gotta see Cummins. Um, uh, man, thank you. I'm, I'm not one to ask for a shout out. I have never emailed anyone for something like this, but I know my friend would think it's cool to get some love from you. Sending prayers, good wishes to his wife, Amy, that she'll be back up and feeling better. Uh, my friend's name is Abe, Abe and Amy, and he is a card-carrying space lizard, and I like, like I said, a huge fan of yours. Thanks for the time, Dan. Great show in Grand Rapids. Thanks for closing with one of my favorite bits, Jury Duty. The world needs a little more Chicken Joe. Bok bok, playboy. Bok bok. And Ken. Ah, uh, well, man, thanks for sending that in, Ken. And uh, Abe, man, thank you so much, dude. Yeah, huge shout-out to you. Thanks for being so dedicated that you are still coming, uh, even though you, your wife wasn't feeling good. I'm glad she's feeling better now. And Amy, how fucking dare you get sick during my goddamn show? Don't you ever fucking do that again. But uh, other than that, I think you're great. But don't ever get sick. You guys, just in general, uh, it really chaps my ass uh, when you guys get sick and when you don't feel good uh, and when things don't go well in your life. I don't care for it. Uh, I like it when time suckers are only kicking ass. So knock it off. Uh, have everything be great, uh, always. Okay, that's when I'm. That's when I'm the happiest. When you are all also the happiest. But seriously, I hope you're uh, feeling better soon, Amy. And thanks to everyone who sends in messages, man. You know, if you don't hear your shout-outs, not because we don't care. I promise. Sometimes we just get uh, a lot of them coming in. Sometimes it's a random timing of when they come in compared to when I'm prepping the show. Uh, but we appreciate all the messages. Thanks for being the best meat sacks on our for sure. Uh, there is no real debate. It is definitely around planet. Love you guys. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Uh, talk to you next week, time suckers. Uh, don't get dragged into an over a decade long murderous feud this week. Uh, hope again that you had a great Thanksgiving this past week and keep on sucking. <laughs> Ding 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 ding